We have lived in this house for almost eight years now, and there are lots of things to share. Our neighborhood sits on the original town cemetery from the 1800s. In the 70s, when they built the neighborhood, they only removed the graves they needed to put in the foundation and the sewage system. We didn't know this until we had been living here for three to four years. But when we found out, it certainly explained a lot. While we were still in the process of moving in and hadn't even spent the first night in the house, I heard two little kids talking. I heard it clear as day. A girl probably of around 10 or 12 and a little boy who sounded no older than five. I only have two brothers, both younger than me, but still older than either of those kids. It sounded like any younger siblings playing. And because it sounded so normal, I can't remember exactly what was said. Obviously, the first thing I did was call out to them, and then the playing stopped. I never heard them leave. I searched the house and no one was inside. Everyone was in the backyard putting together our swing set. I told my mom what I heard, and she of course didn't believe me. I dropped it, and we moved on. Months later in my room, I'm trying to sleep, when I roll over and see the reflection of a girl in my TV screen. I realized I was seeing her back, long curly blonde hair, and a blue dress that appeared to be from the 1800s. Somehow in my sleep deprived brain, I thought it was my own life sized doll and ignored it and went back to sleep. It definitely wasn't. It was the wrong color and the doll was facing the TV. So there's no way it was her. I didn't tell my mom this time round because she didn't believe me the last time. After that, stuff started moving around. Things fall off the stairs that are carpet. And the lights around the house turn on and off at random. I hear people walking around the house all the time. And still my mother does not believe me. Which is really stupid because she believes in ghosts. I affectionately named the ghost girl Lizzie because it just felt right. Finally, one day I'm out with my friends doing teenage stuff. It's roughly 11 p.m. at night, and all of a sudden, my mum calls me. Tell Lizzie not to scare the crap out of me. Turns out, she'd gotten up to use the bathroom, and when she returned to go back to bed, she'd seen a dark orb hovering over her side of the bed. When she saw it, it quickly exited via the ceiling, and then she called me. Not long after that, we found the local news articles about our neighborhood in the cemetery. We also found out that during a flood one year, one particular casket kept popping back up and it had to be moved. And that a lot of the neighborhood still have headstones visible in their yard. We're horrified because we definitely noticed some weirdly flat stones out near our garden and one only five or six feet from fruit trees that we planted. So now we all accept that we live with a ghost or two Weird stuff happens all the time. They stop throwing stuff off the stairs, but they now show up in our Xbox Connect, turn sinks on, and occasionally knock stuff over. But I also sometimes will hear them talking faintly. I haven't seen either of them since the first time, but I know they're still about. We treat them like family, talk to them, offer them snacks, leave toys out to play with. Life is weird, and new people in the house never take long to notice. Lately, I've also been seeing a shadow cat hanging around. We have two cats already, but neither of them can disappear through walls. So there's that. Another story I have to share is one day my friends and I were leaving the house. I don't remember where we were going, and my mum comes around the corner swearing she saw someone walking down the hallway. We were all in the living room and my brothers weren't home. At the time we had our Xbox set up on a dresser with its own TV so the kids could play games without taking over the living room. And said dresser was right next to the doorway that leads into the hall. My mom says she thinks she heard the Xbox turn on and comments on how easy it would be probably for the ghost to turn it on since the button is so sensitive. We all have a chuckle at the ghosts playing video games and continue to the door. Not 10 minutes later, 
my mum caused me to tell me that the Xbox had in fact been turning on and off repeatedly, that she was trying to watch TV and it started to freak her out. I laugh because of course Lizzie would do that. You just told her how it works, I say, and I hear my mum politely ask her to stop because it's distracting and the beeping from the console stops for maybe a minute or two before it starts again. My mum makes me come back early, supposedly because Lizzie likes me and she'll stop if I ask her. The Xbox continued to turn on and off at random, albeit every once in a while now for the next few weeks. Now when our consoles or even the TV turn on by itself, we'll ask her what she wants to watch and play, but never get an answer. About two years ago, my Nana bought home a Ouija board that she found at a yard sale. I've always been a true believer in the paranormal and it's always been one of my peak interests. I've heard and read enough stories and watched enough shows to know not to mess around with a Ouija board. And quite frankly, they sort of freaked me out. So I wanted nothing to do with it. My Nana on the other hand, doesn't believe in the paranormal whatsoever and thought it would be a fun game for myself, my brother, and the oldest of my two cousins. I left it on the dining room table for days before she made me put it away. I ended up sliding it under my bed in the hopes of just forgetting about it. My brother of 11 and my cousin of 12 bugged me about it constantly because they wanted to play with it and I wouldn't let them. I tried to explain it to them that it wasn't just a game and that it shouldn't be messed with, but they were preteen boys who couldn't help but do things they shouldn't. One day after I got home from work, the boys were there and I had this sneaking suspicion they played with it. I looked under my bed and it was there, but I had this odd feeling. And when I went downstairs and interrogated them about it, at first they denied it. But I saw right through them and they finally admitted that they had played with it. I asked them if they had said goodbye when they were done and they said they did. My cousin likes to over exaggerate stories big time and make up details to be overly dramatic. So when he told me about a couple of things that supposedly happened, I didn't believe him at all. Also, they were boys who liked to mess with each other. So I assumed that that was happening now. A couple of nights later, I got into bed. And as I lay there trying to fall asleep, I get this feeling like I'm being watched. I look over at my closet that has two large sliding doors. And I notice that one of the doors is slightly ajar, which left a small space between the doors. It creeped me out for some reason. So I turned and faced the other way, trying to ignore everything and fall asleep. I finally fell asleep. And the next thing I know, I'm woken up by what felt like someone or something hitting me in the back of the head. I was laying on my back. So the back of my head was fully on my pillow, which made it even weirder. And it wasn't a light hit either. It freaked me out so much. I was shaking. I look around my room and don't see anything. But then all of a sudden, I hear my floor creaking like someone is walking around my bed. I'm so freaked out at this point, it wasn't funny. After laying there a good little while, I finally got the courage to get up and grab my phone and book it to my living room. I sat down and tried to calm, but I still could feel a tingling pulsing sensation on the back of my head. I turned on my phone and realized it was three in the morning. I called my boyfriend now husband with tears streaming down my face from being so freaked out. He didn't pick up. And I swear I called him another 15 to 20 times before I finally gave up. I sat in the chair until my Nana got up around six. I didn't tell her what happened because I knew she wouldn't believe me and say that I was acting dumb. After she got up, I had breakfast and called my boyfriend again and he finally answered. He told me he had his phone on silent, so he didn't know that I had been calling. I gave him so much crap for this and told him what happened and he felt so bad and like an idiot for having his phone on silent. He told me he would have come over in a heartbeat to comfort me and was so apologetic. 
Later that day, he never came over, and we took the Ouija board to a junkyard to get rid of it. My husband is the only one in my family that knows what happened, and I didn't experience anything after I got rid of it. Moral of the story, Ouija boards shouldn't be messed with. When I was in high school, probably around 9th or 10th grade, my best friend had a boyfriend that was older and lived fairly far away, so he was not from our school or anything. Not sure how they met. When we would spend the night at my house, or we would go to the mall or to see a movie, he would often stalk us. We would be in my house, and he would drive by slowly. Keep in mind he lived nowhere near there, so it was no accident. This was while they were dating. I think he wanted to check up to make sure she wasn't cheating or something. He would look to see if my car was at my house, etc. One time, we were at an amusement park that was local, and he just happened to show up there. My friend, bless her heart, was kind of dumb and naive, so she honestly thought it was some happy accident he showed up there while we were there. Obviously, I knew this was intentional. It was pretty annoying that she and I could do nothing without him showing up or following us. I used to talk to him, and he told me he wanted to poke holes in their contraception so that he could get her pregnant so she wouldn't leave him. I told her what he said, and she still carried on sleeping with him. Finally, she got some sense and decided she wanted to break up. Well, that did not go well. She had a grandmother and was elderly, in the early stages of dementia at the time. Lived alone, for only a few minutes from my friend so they could keep an eye on her and take care of her. Well, apparently, the crazy boyfriend began visiting the elderly grandmother regularly on his own. No one knew he was doing this, since she was just a confused old woman. He was saying all kinds of things to her to try and manipulate her. It worked to the point that the grandmother thought he was a great guy, and that my friend and her mom and stepdad were awful for treating him badly. The grandmother had some kind of episode where she was yelling at my friend's parents about everything. It got to the point where they had to take out a restraining order, so that the guy could no longer approach her or the grandmother. I'm not a scaredy cat, but I was getting a little nervous myself because he did know where I lived, and he knew I was probably one of the ones encouraging her to break up with him and I worried he may retaliate. But lucky for everyone involved, he took the hint and stayed away. But that is truly a shady tactic to manipulate an innocent old woman with dementia into turning her own daughter and granddaughter and confusing the poor old woman. What a piece of work. When I was almost 12, the woman living above me was a coke dealer. The night of my 12th birthday, she went missing. Not long after, her boyfriend came down to ask if he could use our phone. This was 2004, so having a cell phone was more of an exception to the rule, at least in my area. For a little context, I was home alone a lot of the time, while my mum was at work about a five-minute walk away. My mum had let our neighbour and her boyfriend come in to use our phone several other times before, so I assumed nothing was wrong with it and let him in, bringing him into the living room which is towards the front of our apartment to use the phone in there. He picks up the receiver, dials a number, waits a few seconds, then hangs up the phone. He does this a few more times before the front door of the building opens. You can easily hear the front door open from where we are, as it's a heavy door, and the walls are very thin. It's just the way our apartment is set up. Me and my mum's apartment was the only one on the first floor, and our upstairs neighbour's apartment was the only one above us. My neighbour's boyfriend looked at me, put his finger to his lips, like he was trying to shush me, and told me not to tell anyone he was there before speed walking to my room at the other end of the apartment. I watched my bedroom door close right before there was a loud, hard, cop-like knock on the door. My jaw dropped as I opened the door to see a cop. He asked if my neighbor's boyfriend was there and being scared, I stammered out. Yeah, he just went into my room. 
The officer asked if he could come in, to which I agreed, and as he was coming in, he asked if I could get his partner in the back door and lead them to my room. We walked together to the back of the apartment and I let in his partner. The back door to the apartment was right next to my bedroom door, but we had to walk around the kitchen table to get there. There was just barely enough space between the two doors to fit a narrow rectangular table against it without blocking the path to either door. After I let them into my room, I watched as they pulled my neighbor's boyfriend out of my bedroom closet. As they brought him out of my room and towards the back door, which led to an enclosed fire escape. They told me to go wait in the living room while they brought him out the back door. I walked back to the living room and after they closed the door, I couldn't hear what they were saying, but I could hear the distinct sound of metal clinking and quickly realized that he had just been handcuffed. Still scared, I waited for the police car to drive away before grabbing my keys, making sure the back door was locked and locking the front door on my way out before running to my mum's work crying. I'm pretty sure I cut the five minute trip to about two and I've never been a faster runner. I was fueled entirely on adrenaline and fear at that point. I just wanted my mum. When I told her what happened, my mum was pissed that he had used me the way he had, hiding out in a child's bedroom closet of all the places to try and keep the cops from finding him. She gave me a short but gentle lecture that night about not letting people in to use the phone, telling me that I was not to let people use our phone even if I knew them unless she was home. I didn't know what exactly he wanted from us, nor do I know what would have happened if the cops hadn't have shown up. I don't know if he had known that the cops were on their way and he had come to my apartment specifically to hide from them or if he was up to something else and knew it was the cops when the front door building opened. Our upstairs neighbor's boyfriend, let's never meet again. My dad, Don Baker, was a character and a half, larger than life, a big man with enormous presence and a booming laugh, good humored and loquacious until a switch was flicked somewhere and suddenly he was angry and dangerous. He married my mother when I was six years old and I came to know both sides of him very well. Those were the only two sides he seemed to have until he told me this story when I was in my early twenties and for the first time I saw him uncertain, pensive, and apparently moved by something profound that he didn't understand. Eager to get away from the confines of his small Minnesota hometown and what he called his Norsky family, he lied about his age to join the army at 17 in 1938. Almost immediately, he was attached to the OSS and sent to China in the aftermath of the invasion of Shanghai by Japan where he was tasked with gathering intelligence about the growing bloodshed in the area. After Pearl Harbor, he spent the first two years of the war as a paratrooper in the South Pacific until he sustained injuries so severe that he was sent back stateside for hospitalization. After a few months in the hospital, he was deemed well enough to be discharged, but not fit enough to return to action. So, he was attached to the 11th Airborne when it was activated at Camp Mackle in North Carolina. As one of a cadre of flyers and paratroopers who set up the division jump school. While there, he and some of his fellow paratroopers began devising strategies for paratrooper recon. And that brings me to the story he told me. During the Korean War, and long since reassigned to intelligence. He was one of an elite chalk who jumped behind enemy lines to gather information and bring it back to the front line. Because troop movements and skirmishing meant that the front was always changing. Return routes were constantly being redrawn and sometimes not quickly enough. 
Many of the paratroopers in the regiment lost their lives because of this inherent danger. On the way back to the front and carrying extremely important information, my dad had made it from his recomposition to a spot along the route, about halfway home, when a brutal swarm swept in during the late afternoon and he had to seek shelter. There was a cave on the route that was behind him. He had to backtrack a short way to it. And once there, he said he sort of had to hunker down and wait for the storm to pass. So he did what any soldier would do in that position. He grabbed some Z's. Sometime later, he was awoken by another member of his team who jumped a day or two before my dad. I can't remember his name, but he was one of my dad's good friends, Buddy. The storm continued to rage outside, but Buddy said he had to risk moving through it to quickly get to my dad, because near to the front, the route dad was on had been compromised. In the dim glow of the small flashlight, Buddy traced a map in the dirt of another route from the cave to the front that was as safe to follow as any such route is behind enemy lines in a shooting war. And then clapped dad on the back and said, you'll get yourself home in one piece. And then saying he had something else to do, he ducked out of the cave and was gone. Dad said Buddy had probably spent no more than five minutes with him in that cave, most likely less. And he added that he really didn't think too much about it at the time. So dad made it back out to the front without incident in no more than a few days. Once he dropped off the intelligence, he hit the mess and then his tent and slept the deep sleep of the truly exhausted. When he awoke the next day and polished himself up, he went to the mess before going to his full debriefing and found a few more of his buddies having breakfast. They hailed him and told them how glad they were he made it back. He was a little taken by surprise at their enthusiasm and told them that they weren't going to shake him off anytime soon. They made small talk for a few minutes and then dad asked when Buddy had gotten in. The guys exchanged glances and one of them said, didn't make it bake. Dad perplexed, looked from one another and said, he went out again already? And then dad said, it was the guys on the team that looked confused. No, Don, one of them replied. Buddy never made it back from the last jump. At this point, my dad told me he'd begun to get angry. That can't be possible, he declared to the others. I came back after him on the new route, and if anything had happened to him, I'd have seen evidence of it, or a fight or confrontation or more activity. But the new route was clean as a whistle, so quit lying to me, goddammit. The other team members visibly stilled, he said, and the atmosphere was strained. After a few more tense moments, the guy who had been answering him leaned towards him and quietly but intently asked him, what new route bake? Flustered, irritated and feeling a growing sense of unease, dad responded, the new route that buddy came back to tell me about, the route by the South Pass? At that, dad said, the guys were completely stunned. The spokesman for the group, white faced, shook his head. That can't be done. He answered. Four days ago, Buddy was killed on his way back from his last recon. He almost weighed it all the way back. One of our scouts was watching for him and saw the whole thing. The Reds went through his pockets and got the intelligence packet. Since that's where the maps are, including the route you were both taking, we thought you were a goner. That's the story. When he finished talking, he fixed me with a grim smile and said, Buddy was there in that cave with me, as real as you are right now. He was there. It was as if he was answering an argument from me, but of course he was talking to himself. And by the time he got to me, he was dead, already, by a day at least. If he hadn't have come to stop me from following the same route to give me a new one, I'd be dead too. Sometimes I wonder if I dreamed at all, but damn it, the facts are the facts. I've got back by taking a route I didn't even know of until that night I spent in the cave. 
Back in the 80s, I was in college and lived in a dorm room. I never owned a Ouija board, but if someone had one, then I'd either watch or participate. To be honest, this was one of the first times I ever used it. I had a question for the board. My grandmother had my father when she was young and single. That was a big deal back in the 1930s. When she found out she was pregnant, she ran away from home, dropped my father off at her parents' house when he was six months old and left, coming to visit less and less frequently. By the time he was five, she'd never come back at all and vanished. So my father was raised by an aunt, never really knew his mother, and didn't have any idea who his father was. By the time he was in his 40s, he wanted to find her. Lots of dead ends, but he eventually did. Anyway, that night I asked the board if my grandmother was alive. The board said yes, and I asked if she lived in my home state. The board said yes. I asked if she lived in my hometown. The board said yes. I asked what street she lived on, and the board spelled out the name of the street, Washington Street. At the time, I wasn't sure if there was a Washington Street in my hometown, but it turns out there was. No, Grandma didn't live there, but two years later, my father found his mum. She lived in my home state, in the town of Washington. It wasn't the street's name, it was the town's name. How messed up is that? More than 30 years later, I still have no explanation. I worked at a local pizza joint in my small hometown back in 2016. About six months into the job, I had an older man around 70 years old come in. He walked up to the counter and had asked me for a soda. He then sat at a table. A few minutes later, he came back up to the counter and asked what my name was. I told him, as we didn't have name tags. I didn't think anything of it. And he walked back down to the table to sit down. Ten minutes go by and he came back up to the counter and said, What would you say if I were to ask you on a date? Immediately I got a bad feeling. I uncomfortably laughed it off and told him no. He then left. A few hours later I saw him walking back up to the pizza place. I told my co-worker that I was uncomfortable and that I didn't want to serve him. She agreed with me and I hid in the back while she spoke with him. After a few minutes, I came back and she told me what happened. She said he asked for me and she told him that no one named Courtney works here. And then he said, yes, she does. She's 5'3", has purple hair and she's off on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. I'd never seen this guy before, but somehow he knew my work schedule. I immediately called my dad. He's an officer and I wanted to see what I could do. There wasn't anything I could do, but avoid him whenever I was working. I had to let everyone know the situation and how uncomfortable I was. However, when he came in, they forced me to handle him. The next time he came in, he was telling me about his 18-year-old girlfriend in the Philippines. He then went to the restroom and was banging around in there for at least an hour. And then he just left. I would occasionally look out the window to see what was going on outside. And I would see him in his car with a newspaper in front of his face, watching me. Everyone would tell him to leave me alone and that I was only 18. He didn't care. He would follow me around the grocery store, which was right next to the pleats of place. I got used to all of this. Eventually, he put in a job application at the pizza place. I read the resume. In the experience section, there were a few normal things. However, the last few things sent shivers down my spine. He had listed janitorial experience and chainsaw experience. My coworkers and boss thought this was hilarious, so they put it on the wall, and whenever I couldn't perform up to their standards, they said they'd give him a call and give him the job. I soon left after that, so I'm not sure if he continued to try and chat with the other girls. A few months later, I started working at a rescue center. I was talking to a few co-workers and they brought this guy up. The exact same thing happened to one of them at the previous jobs. Some 70-year-old stalker. Creepy. This happened when I was a toddler, and don't remember it myself, but my family has told me through the years 
And something that happened to me a few nights ago made me think about it, and my mum filled me in on the details. My mum is a sensitive and can walk into a house and feel spirits, and sometimes tells you if they're evil or just lost. In my family, we have a good amount of non-believers, but also plenty of family members who do believe. So growing up, I've always just felt comfortable with all that. I've lived in haunted houses. Spirits have visited me. And the specific story happened when I was four or five. My parents were going through some marriage troubles. My father was getting abusive and lashing out, and obviously my mum was struggling with that. After three months of attitude and personality changes, things started happening to me. I would get bruises on my body, scratches on my back. Some of them so bad they started bleeding, and I was changing. I'd have trouble sleeping, hated being alone. And I hated my room, and I kept telling people that the man was hurting me. Obviously, this led people to believe it was my father doing it. He had been hitting my mother, yelled at me, and locked me in a closet. So my mum kicked him out, leaving him to go stay with his own father while she tried to figure out what to do. This helped, or so it seemed. I started getting back to normal. I was happy and bubbly, but the bruises and scratches faded. And we were happy for about a month. During a normal bath time, my mother and I were playing with one of my dolls when she noticed something. There was a long scratch down my back. At first, she wrote it off as kids playing around and scratching themselves. That had to be it. But they kept appearing. The bruises were coming back, and then I started talking about the man again. My mum said the way I described him was chilling. And she instantly believed me and contacted her uncle, who was a priest for prisons. The story I told my mum was that at night, after she put me to bed, someone would come out of my closet, not just walk way out. A mist would come from under the closet door, and a man would appear from that mist. This man wore what looked to be jeans and a white tank top, which my mum figures was a wife beater of some sort, and would sit on my bed. And talk to me. At first, he was nice and play with my hair. He would tell me stories. His name was Bill. He used to be a cop, and he had lost his wife and family because he was bad to them. And then he started to change. He wanted me to go to the closet with him, and that scared me for whatever reason. Even that young, I knew something was wrong. Looking back at the time, my mum believes that it was when I started to be scared of my room. And when I wanted to refuse to sleep in there, after I refused the man, he got worse and mean, and started hurting me, which is when the bruises and scratches began to appear. He would try pulling me from the bed to the closet. He would throw things at me. But what got my mum is when I started describing what the man said he would do to me and my family if I didn't come with him. Understandably, my mum was very upset. And she called her uncle Tucker, knowing what it had to be. Though she wasn't sure why she'd never felt him, and she felt she had failed me in some way, when Tucker arrived, he talked to me, wanting to know the story, which I shared with him. It piqued his interest because it was a chance that it was simply my imagination. They both felt that my story might have been swayed some, at least, a few details. Once he was talking to me, he headed to my room, Bible and holy water in hand. They have both told me that when he walked into the room, instantly something dark washed over him, and it worried him. So he started praying, talking to it, and finally blessed the room. And Tucker said he could guarantee that it was a demon, and it wanted my soul and possibly to take over my body. From what he could put together, from what was shown. And told in the room along with my story, he believes that Bill was a cop, or at least would use that to make his victims more comfortable around him, which wasn't uncommon. And he was sure Bill had harmed his family, and that's why they left him. Tucker thought that the ghost slash spirit slash demon, whatever you want to call it, was hooked onto me not only because I was a child, which makes the connection easy, but because I was most likely sensitive like my mother, which Tucker had strongly believed. Since they found out she was pregnant, I won't go into details behind that because there's a lot of information. 
Back to the point. He warned her that it was probably going to keep happening and that I would deal with it my entire life. That I just needed to be strong and not to trust in every spirit I see. Luckily, after he blessed the house and prayed over me, Bill left, and I never dealt with him again. Thankfully, I was young enough that I don't have a memory of it. I've seen pictures of the scratches and bruises, but don't remember it. And while Bill might have left me, I've dealt with spirits my entire life, and I know I always will. Two years ago, two friends and I decided to go on a late night adventure and drive to a bigger city about an hour away from our hometown. We got to the city around 11 p.m. and were just exploring random areas there. I had my iPhone plugged into the car playing music, and out of nowhere the music cut out and the screen changed to maps. A destination was entered in the map, and a male AI voice began telling us where to go. We decided to follow it like it wasn't something straight out of a horror movie. The first destination it took us was a worn out road at the back end of a construction site. The road went up to a forest that was surrounded by large fences. There were no trespassing signs everywhere. So we decided to turn around. The GPS then rerouted us to another point about 20 minutes away from the first. We drove to the second point and it was a dead end road on the opposite side of the forest from the first road. We were pretty freaked out by the experience and reconnected my phone and went back home. Fast forward a few days ago. One of my friends who I had gone with was talking to me on the phone. He brought up the experience and we decided to look into it. We found the two roads on Google Earth and could see a house in the forest with a clearing behind it. We started doing some research on the house and came across a court document connected to the address. Developers had bought the land and were denied approval to build on the land where the house stood. I didn't think much of it until I read further and saw why they were denied. The clearing we saw on Google Earth ended up being a cemetery where the original settlers of the city were buried. With more research, we came to find that a man who had owned the land sometime before the 90s had moved every headstone, leaving the graves unmarked. It took historians years to discover the cemetery, and they were granted permission to make a thorough report on it. They found 99 grave shafts, but 60 of them were much smaller, meaning they belonged to children. The developers had unveiled in court that they simply moved the remains into a corner of the new subdivision without any cemetery. The other road that we were brought to was on the other side of the forest as if it wanted us to drive from one side to the other when we didn't make the main road. The weirdest part about this whole experience was when we noticed the court date was exactly 10 years ago from the date we did the research. We found it odd that it took us so long to look into what the GPS could have been taking us to, and that out of every day it happened, it happened on the 10 year anniversary. It's pretty crazy. I honestly believe that our GPS was being manipulated by a spirit that belonged to the graveyard and they wanted to let us know what had happened there. If you care to do your research, it's called Lime Kiln Road, Ancaster. The road into the forest, Bailey Road, Ancaster. Second Dead End Road, Cooley Hat Pioneer Cemetery. This experience didn't happen to me, but my friend. They were working during the day when the command had training. We all go to basketball stadium and listen to people talk. After the training, we go home and it's about 11. Great waste of time. My friend and I had watch and didn't get to go back. They were sitting there and the commanding officer walks in. The pleasantries are exchanged and the commanding officer goes to their office. After a few hours, the commanding officer calls and asks, I thought you said no one was here. Yes, sir. You're the only one here. You, myself and the rover. He then asked the rover to go walk around because he was very clearly hearing talking and walking down the hall. Remember, there's only one way in and one way out of this building, so you know when people come and go. Rover left, walked around the outside, and all fences were locked. 
We went first floor again, and the common area was empty. The offices were locked, and the second floor and common areas were clear. The commanding office was open with all the others locked. Rover came back and reported what they found, and the friend asked them if they went into the basement, which was a former morgue, and the kids said no. So away they went. During his look, he found and discovered that he could hear the commanding officer talking through a vent on the second floor. So as he's checking the area, he comes to the place where the lockers and old workout equipment is. He flips the light on in there, flips off the light, and then he hears a rattle. So he turns the lights on again, and now a locker is open. He couldn't remember for sure if it was open before or not. So he turns off the light and hears what sounds like music and maybe a radio coming from the locker and the slamming of a metal door. At that point, the kid ran and they called the commanding officer and told him no one was around. There was also another occasion where I was standing watch and the ground had a big crash and shake like a server rack fell over. Someone went to look and there was nothing on the floor. No one has any explanation for that. There are also reports of a headless nurse, but I haven't seen her. A nurse would make sense since that's where all the deaths from the Pearl Harbor attack happened. I am the youngest of four brothers, all a year apart. At this time, I was about nine and our family friend was spending the night at our place. We lived in a two story house with a basement. At this time, my mother was single and dating a lot. So during this particular night, she was away. We saw how to make a Ouija board on this episode of a show called Mystery Hunters, a Canadian kids channel, YTV. So we decided it would be a fun thing to try while we had the house to ourselves. So we cut up an old cardboard box and made a Ouija board from it. We put felt on the bottom of the triangle thing so that it would slide better and it worked pretty well. We all tried putting our fingers on the triangle and asking questions, but got no response. Then me and my brother asked a question to the likes of, is there a demon here? And the triangle started to move. We looked at each other and the expression on our faces showed that it was neither of us moving the triangle. We immediately got scared and ran into the kitchen. When we got there, we heard a crash come from the living room. It sounded like our TV fell off the wall unit. But when we ran back, we saw that nothing was wrong. After this, we decided to grab a Bible and read. The first words we read in unison were, God's people are doomed. Frightened by this, we turned on the TV and saw it was Dave Chappelle, so we assumed it was going to be something funny. But when the audio began, the first words from Dave were, and all the people died, to which the audience started laughing, and then it went to a commercial. Freaked out by both of these strange and unlikely things happening, the waterworks began, and we got up and ran upstairs crying and screaming to my brother's bedroom. When we got up the stairs and into his bedroom, we heard footsteps that sounded exactly like ours run up the stairs after us. Immediately, I assumed it was one of my brothers or our friends late up the stairs. But then we realized we were all in the room and no one passed by the door. We began to panic. So we held each other freaking out. It's hard to say if we heard anything after this point. So this was the last that happened for now. Two hours later, me and my brother, the bravest of the four, decided that this might be all in our heads and that we would go play video games on my mum's computer in her office, Diablo 2 to be exact. The door to her office had no handle, so my brother pushed the door open and immediately after he pushed the door, it slammed back on his arm and all the way from the basement, we heard clear and loud laughter. The only way I can describe it is it was the sound of a witch that echoed through the entire house. At this point, we ran down the stairs, out the door into my grandmother's house, which was down the street and waited for mum to come home. I'm not sure if she completely believed us, but this was when we were kids. I'm 23 years old now, 
and this story sticks out as the only and craziest paranormal experience I have ever had. I'm a female volunteer for the fire department, and this happened a few years back when I was 20. During our drills at my former department, our bay doors are open so people have been known to walk in and talk to us and ask questions or just look at the trucks. One evening this 23 year old dude strolls by, a fellow firefighter from another town which isn't uncommon. Firemen stop by other departments all the time when in town. He made his rounds and was talking to my chief, my captain and the young guys. And he made his way over to me and started chatting me up. He was a nice guy, good looking and we exchanged snapchats. It didn't take us long to figure out that he was a psycho. A week after talking with me, he messages me. So how come you didn't swipe right? Confused, I asked him what he meant and then this unfolded. He told me all of this in an attempt to impress me with how devoted he was. He found me on a dating app, used my profile picture from the dating app to find my Facebook, since in one of my Facebook pictures I'm wearing a uniform that had my last name. Definitely my bad. He then used my profile picture to find out what fire department I was on by looking closely at the fire truck in the background. He told me he walked by my fire department almost every day to see when we drilled and to spot me, and that he's telling me this. I'm confused as heck and he then goes, I'm having a pretty rough day, can I come over? Cue to him telling me he's on his way. He used my Snapchat location to find my work and house. My location now is off on everything. When he arrived, he brought a love letter and gifts. He said he was sorry and confused and just really wanted things to work out. I told him that he needed to leave and never speak to me again, to which he obliged by leaving, saying if that would make me happy. He then made three to four new Snapchat and Facebook profiles in an attempt to add me back. At one point he got clever and made his Snapchat username Chris Smith 1990 which made me go, hey, it's my friend Chris Smith. Lo and behold, it isn't. Once I realized it wasn't my friend, but instead the psycho, he asked what I could do to make it up. I texted get lost and to set himself on fire. And then I got a video of him walking into the woods. And then he did that. He flicked a lighter over his hand and I thought, haha, yeah, then his entire hand and arm lit up, followed by screaming and it cut out. I started to freak out thinking, oh crap, and immediately got a photo of the hairs on his knuckles and arms burnt off and his burnt shirt. He was okay and was coated in something flammable, but something that wouldn't actually damage him. Creep. I blocked him again. He stopped coming over after he presented himself at my house and he saw that I had a firearm. I didn't know how to use it and I wasn't planning on using it in fairness, but it sent the point across. This didn't happen to me, but has been relayed to me from my late grandfather, who was one of the most honest men I have ever met. He was the kind of guy whose word meant law. When he said something, that was it. It wasn't ever a lie. In any case, here is his story. My grandfather was born in 1931 in a poor and rural part of the US. From a young age, he helped his parents on the farm, as I'm sure many other kids at that era were forced to do. Towards the end of the farm, the land sort of went down a small hill, at which point it wasn't very harvested by my family and bordering the bottom of the hill was a deep and dark forest. There'd be times my grandpa would tell me when he was about 10 or 11, when he'd get to the edge at the top of the hill and look down towards the forest. There'd be times where he would see a dark shape, a shadow staring at him with glowing green eyes. He always thought it was his imagination and after telling his mum one day, she told him that it was one of the forest sprites and to ignore it. And if he ignored it, it would leave him alone. 
He took her advice and tried to ignore it. He didn't see it frequently, but when he did, he really tried to pretend it didn't exist because it frightened him deeply. Something so wrong. He said its aura, its presence, felt dark. That's the best way he could describe it. A continued oppressive feeling that bore down on him. Weeks at a time went by, and he wouldn't see the figure frequently. About two years later, once again, finishing up at the end of the field, did he dare to glance down, admiring the sunset, when he saw the twinkle of green eyes and a dark shadowy blob move behind the trees. He didn't even bother looking. He just bolted home. And that same night, as he was going to bed and turning out the light, did he look out and see something in the distance? The glowing eyes. They were no longer in the forest, which wasn't visible from his house. Instead, it was by some nearby trees in the distance. He got spooked. He jumped straight into bed without drawing the curtains and pulled the covers up to his eyes. There he lay, looking intently at the darkness under his sheets. He tried falling asleep, but the fear was all consuming. When it got to a point, he told himself he must be imagining it. Did he pull down the covers ever so slightly, just to get that sweet reassurance that there was nothing in there with him? pulled the covers back, and there was nothing in the room. He chanced to look at the window. He was going to make a run for it and close the curtains quickly. But just as he was about to close them, did he notice that the pair of green eyes were now dangerously close to the window. As they closed, he ran back into bed in absolute darkness and fell asleep, shaking. At some point in the night, he awoke needing to use the bathroom. He remembers slipping off his bed, taking a few steps and hearing a creak. This wasn't the distinct creak of the floor. This was the creak of his closet door. He thought it was strange, but assumed it was either a cat or a dog as they had several that lived on the farm and he walked to the toilet. Upon returning from doing his business and getting back to bed, did he hear the creak once more? He was tired, but still afraid from the events of earlier. He was still trying to convince himself that it never happened and was all in his imagination. And with the tinge of bravery still lingering inside him, did he sit up properly and squint towards the dark corner of the room where the sound had came from. It was the closet. He thought maybe he'd best check to make sure nothing strange was going on. So he got out of bed again, pulled the door to the closet back, which was slightly ajar, and in the bottom, near his shoes, were those green eyes. He said he can't remember anything that happened after that, other than the dark mass, this blob with the green eyes rising higher than his clothes, and suddenly he passed out. He woke up in the morning at the foot of his closet on his wooden floor, in pain a little bit, his mother asking if he was all right. He had no recollection of the night before until later that day, when it all came back to him. He never saw the green-eyed thing again, but it scared the living daylights out of him. And for a long time, he refused to go anywhere near that forest. His sisters all enjoyed going down to that forest to play with their friends, but he would always stay clear of it. The house and property were eventually sold off when he was a young adult, and he's never been back, and has refused to tell me where it was located in case the creature, whatever it may be, 
still remains. My entire life, my grandfather has lived in a large home in a somewhat wooded area in a town outside of Dallas, Texas. We would camp out and explore the area when I was younger, before people decided to start building more in that area. In order to get to the house, you would have to turn off the main road into a cemetery. Not sure why, but the road cut straight through a pretty large old cemetery. I like to go there on nice days and look around sometimes. It's a good walk from my grandfather's house down a road heavily lined with trees. I've seen gravestones with dates as far back as the early 1800s, and they are always really neat in my opinion. So at this point in time, I'm between homes and staying with my grandfather. It was about 1am and I'm hanging out with a friend from work, telling them about how I like this cemetery. They're interested in going to see the place and want to take some long exposure pictures with a camera that they recently got. So we head that way and I take them to where all the really old graves are. Now I've always been somewhat sensitive to things considering paranormal. I've had a few weird experiences and tend to trust my instincts when I feel something's off. From the time I parked inside the cemetery that night, I probably knew that I shouldn't be there. My instinct was kicking in. But I ignored my gut, because my friend was excited and I really wanted to show them this cemetery and explore the surrounding woods with them. So we walked along the wood line towards the far back corner where the oldest graves are to take some pictures of the headstones and pay our respects to the people who have been there the longest. My friend takes a lot of pictures and I walk around with the flashlight, adding lighting and reading the graves. The entire time I'm feeling like I'm being watched. I shake the feeling and again ignore my instinct because my friend looks like they're wrapping up. They start looking through their images while I make sure we got all our trash and water bottles that we brought with us. A friend calls me over while I'm doing this and asks me to look at one of the photos they just took of some graves and the tree line. I look at the photo, a little bit freaked out, but I realize I probably need to stay calm for my friend's sake. I look up to where the photo was taken and see what the camera saw. What my friend doesn't see is in the tree line is a large black humanoid mass with glowing red eyes. I'm not sure how else to describe it, but it looked and felt like rage personified. In all my life, all the times I've explored the area, I had never seen or felt anything like that. I ask my friend to slowly start walking back to the car. I'm pretty sure they knew something was wrong because I was dead serious and hardcore staring where they just took that creepy photo. I'm backing my way to the car and watch the shadow watch us as we leave. We get to a point where I can see the car, but not the shadow anymore. So I turn around and start power walking towards my car, key in hand. I'm still on the edge, but I'm feeling better that we're getting out of there. All of a sudden, the shadow appears about 20 foot to my right in the tree line. I tell my friend to run the rest of the way to the car, and at this point we are running and are almost to the car when my friend glances behind us and sees this thing for the first time. They freak out, speed to the car and frantically leap into the passenger side. I have just gotten my keys in the ignition when the shadow slams into my friend's door, its face right up against the glass. Imagine having a solid shadow, featureless, and then with two red LEDs where the eyes are. That's about what we saw menacing us on the other side of the glass. I get in the car and started to pull out as fast as I could without hitting any graves and start to drive the hell out of there. I find the official gate, even though there are plenty of other closer exits to the road, but I've always heard if you enter and leave through the same gate of a cemetery, you leave everything you found there and can't take it with you. I'm telling you now, that's all BS. But that's for another story. We're leaving, 
when this thing is keeping up with us all the way to the gate and it stops. We head to the main road and to my friend's place, laughing hysterically because the adrenaline was wearing off and we survived something crazy. I get them home, but I have to go back through the cemetery to get home myself. And thankfully I didn't see the shadow again, but I believe this is because my friend wasn't with me. After that night, I had a bunch of more crazy things happen to me in the area while hanging out with them. But I think for now, that's enough. I thought we were being respectful. In any case, remember to respect cemeteries, everyone. In 2005, I hit Okinawa, Japan's shores at the ripe age of 19. I never had an experience or reason to believe in the paranormal at this point. For the next two years, all was well, drinking, smoking and having fun. In 2006, I sustained an eye injury in Fallujah, Iraq, that put me out of commission. Every Marine is a rifleman, and as I could no longer shoot, they made me a barracks manager, as my unit was deployed yet again. I was pumped for this job, as I didn't want to be discharged before my four years were up. That, and everyone knew it was a skate job, aka easy as hell. I had the usual problems of broken furniture and such for a while. One day a marine comes into my office and tells me, there's a woman in a white dress with long black hair that covers half her face who sits in the upper corner of my room and watches me as I sleep. I think to myself this man has seen the ring too many times. I tell him I cannot move his room and to move on with it. At this point in time, I'm manager of Barrack 5696. There came a time when Barrack 5704, diagonal from us, was empty and we needed renovations. I was in charge of moving everyone to 5704 in order for renovations to begin. After all had been moved and everything was calm, I began an addiction to watching shows like Ghost Adventures and Ghost Hunters, back when they were really fresh and new and thought to myself, this is all rubbish, and found myself verbally saying such things out loud. And a buddy of mine said, hey man, don't you have the keys to 5696? He was right, I did. It was totally empty at night. Piquing my interest, I bought a tape recorder, old school, not a digital recorder, and went into the room the Marine told me about nearly a year ago, set it on top of the mirror above the sink and locked the door. I left and locked the main and only entrance to Barrack 5696 and went back to Barrack 5704. The next day, I let the Japanese painters do their job as I did every day and went back up to room 423 to collect the recorder off the top of the mirror. I returned back to my office in 5704 and listened to the tape. I spent nearly four hours listening to nothing, dead space. Then it happened. The wall locker in a room next to or adjacent to room 423 began slamming shut, open and shut, open and shut. This went on for a few minutes before other rooms started as well. After a few minutes from the first slamming wall locker, it seemed like the building had come alive. I was disturbed as I was the only individual with a key there. Any enlisted, even above me, would have to either ask me for the key or get one made. Once they did, I cannot fathom them wanting to slam wall lockers closed in the middle of the night nor able to slam as many as I was hearing at the same time without 20 people at least to help. Yet I heard nothing but slamming wall lockers, no footsteps, no voices, no nothing. Knowing I placed the recorder and told no one, locked the door to the room and the main door to the barracks creeped me out. No one had access to the barracks nor knew of my intentions. I was convinced the ghost realm was real, just like Zack. I wanted to find what was out there. I wanted more proof of these spirits. Barracks 
5696 was still under renovation, which meant it was completely empty at night, as there were no Japanese working crews then, and I held the only key. I convinced a buddy of mine who I'll refer to as G to come with me. We were going to conduct a live ghost hunting session. As exciting as it sounds, it wasn't. We never heard or saw anything. Being our first time, we felt weird talking to empty rooms of nothingness. We felt like nothing was there, but we were wrong. We would pick random rooms throughout the barracks, opening whichever room we felt at the time. As we walked down to the office of 5696, as it still had power and the office was functional, we joked that there was nothing there, and the banging wall locker still haunted my thoughts and I wanted to know more. So I plugged in my digital recorder into the PC and started the exhausting journey of reviewing our files, one for each room. G was unconvinced as we entered rooms three or four on the recording. Then it happened. I said the usual, good evening, my name's Will, and G asked, can you tell us your names? Clear as day, we get a response that said, get out neither of our voices, and we were within arm's reach of each other. This was the first of many threats I received, attempting to find the truth inside this barracks, a truth that came to manifest my home life, and made me never want to mess with the paranormal again. But I did. The allure was just too strong, and sometime later, the following events happened. I was living off base at the time with a girlfriend in a 10 story building. We were on the 10th floor and everything seemed fine when we moved in. At least she never mentioned anything at this point. After a few weeks of doing EVPs nightly at 5696, she started to talk about this shadow person. I asked her where she saw it. There wasn't anything about it other than shadow. Was it threatening towards you? All the usual stuff. She said it was always in the walk-in closet, had some color of glowing eyes, orange I think, and just creeped her out in general, but never tried to harm her. After hearing this, I started to freak out, as I was having some issues in 5696 that I never mentioned to her. It seems like I may have brought home, or perhaps it's been here the whole time. During this time frame, I started getting strange things on my EVPs, not the usual get outs or hellos, but things that seemed far more intelligent and sinister. For example, I would always introduce myself. Hello and good evening. My name is William. I only wish to communicate and mean you no harm. Besides my name, these entities should have known nothing else about me. Then I was getting responses from them calling me by my childhood nickname, a nickname I hadn't used in years, and the other guys with me damn sure didn't. They once asked who my mother was. Now this may not have been specifically aimed towards me, if it wasn't followed up by a whisper saying my mother's name, which was a different voice from the first. I lost patches of hair on the back of my head, it looked like fingerprints in a pattern, suggesting something had grabbed the back of it. Doctor said it was stress and gave me a steroid shot, but the hair refused to grow back for three months. Three months just so happened to be the same time I grew concerned with the EVPs I was getting and threw in the town. I locked 5696 up one final time and never returned there after dark. The hair that grew back was pitch black and I had blonde hair, and stayed that way for many years. These days it's slightly lighter, maybe from sun exposure, but it's never been the same color it should be. Finally, I had a dream in a 10 story building right before I quit. And it was some kind of evil red creature laughing and prodding at me while it tortured me. When I woke and realized it was just a dream, I was relieved. Shortly after this dream of mine, which I never told anyone, my girlfriend had a similar dream. We went through a rough patch and I moved out of the apartment, but she left shortly after, stating something was bothering our son in the middle of the night, something unseen. Today, she's a minister and swears to me I brought something evil home all those years ago, and that it 
has been following her. In 1979, when my mother was 15, a large group of my extended family were gathered in my grandmother's house in rural Iowa, where most of them live. They were there to discuss what was to be done with my recently deceased great grandmother's house. You see, my great grandmother had hated the house, and so in the final six months of her life, had built another house on the same plot of land, which I guess wasn't in accordance with state zoning laws. As any logical thinker would do, they decided to ask my great grandmother herself. Ouija board in hand, the female members in the family walk out into the night to do their seance at her house, which was just down the dirt road from where they were. The house was built in the mid 19th century, had six bedrooms, was huge, and from what I can gather, didn't have any electricity. So they brought candles to light the space. About half the women in attendance were believers, with the others being skeptics, which led to some frustration with them asking questions on the Ouija board. However, sometime in the night, the energy of the house totally changed. One of my aunts asked if Margaret was there, but got no response from the board. Instead, a piece of tinsel on the doorway began to swing like a pendulum. My mum's youngest brother had just celebrated his birthday there a few weeks earlier, and the decorations were still up. It would be easy to say that the wind or atmospheric pressure could have accounted for this. However, keep in mind it was in a large house and the rooms surrounding the central living room acted as a wind block. It is also worthwhile to point out that the candles at no point flickered nor went out. The movement continued with every question, back and forth like a pendulum. Finally, someone asks what was going to be done with the house and the tinsel stopped moving altogether and began to violently move in the opposite direction. The tinsel stopped responding after the question. So they moved back to the Ouija board and no sooner had they done it, did it spell out a very simple six letter message. Burn it. They hauled ass back home, called the volunteer fire department and did just that. Me and a long-term girlfriend parted ways, pretty much mutually as the relationship had fizzled out and was even becoming toxic in its own way. So I was more than happy to be done with it. In fact, I had been wanting to break it off for months, but I thought it would devastate her and had too much sympathy for her situation. We both moved on and a few months down the line, I started getting random numbers or private number calls in the middle of the night where it was just silence or nonsense. Then I got a warning message from the ex saying that her current boyfriend was protective, jealous and fiery and was convinced she still had feelings for me and vice versa and or I was continuously trying to mess with her. That's the thing. I literally hadn't spoken to her since the breakup. One day I decided to call the person that kept blowing me up in the middle of the night and that was a mistake as it fueled the dude to go into a rage. It started with long rambling texts, Facebook messages and voicemails. I'm pretty sure the dude was harmless, but some of the material I have saved was to the level of felony harassment, i.e. death threats. Eventually it died off and I forgot about it. Then one day, X hits me up saying she just wanted to be civil and catch up. I decide to decline as I want to avoid drama but she insists her boyfriend trusts her now and there'll be no problems. We chat about some mundane stuff for a bit and that was that. The next day I get a text from her number that is clearly him saying, we knew it all along and yeah, back to square one. Eventually I changed my number, continually blocked social media accounts until they finally broke up and it was all done. But holy hell, I'd never seen such an irrational human being and feel sorry for whatever poor girl that guy ends up with. I had a strange feeling today that left me paranoid, even now as I'm working my typical graveyard shift. Well, it wasn't just a feeling. I wish it was, but unfortunately it is not the case. I'm home alone working on a painting when I hear my floorboards creak. 
Now, my floors are very creaky, and I'm average height and weight, with a fair share of ass-kicking instances. So initially, I was not alarmed. I live with two other people, Andy and Teddy. Both had gone out earlier. I didn't remember hearing Teddy's car pull in. It's a big ass white truck, and it's very hard to miss due to the gravel in the driveway. Even if I had missed it, Andy typically likes to come in yelling or singing obnoxiously. So obviously I was like, what the hell? I wait for a while and hear nothing. So continue painting. Then I get this incredibly horrid feeling of dread. So much so that every muscle in my body tenses. And then the creaking happens again. And me being a classic dummy, put my paintbrush down, open the door to my room, and walk out to see nothing. So I venture out into the kitchen, and the feeling grows stronger. To the point where I feel the need to protect myself. So I dash over to pick up a small knife I remembered Andy had left on the kitchen table earlier. I walk further down the hall, first into the bathroom, where again I see nothing, and then into Andy's room. This is where the feeling grows even worse. I grip the knife as hard as I can behind my pack and peek into the closet. His closet is the type with the double doors that slide open. One of the doors is already pushed open and I can feel something crouching in the darkness behind the closed side. I can feel something watching me. I continue to stare, my breath caught in my throat. Then something changes and it feels as if whatever is in there is now making direct eye contact. It stares at me so much that I stumble back out the room I quickly check Teddy's room, see nothing, and just as quickly nope the hell back to my room. Shaking, I shut the door and put whatever songs I was listening to to its highest volume, and the feeling just disappears. As if a hood was pulled over my head, everything just feels incredibly normal. Whether I'm going crazy or not is debatable. I wouldn't doubt it though. Definitely some weird stuff that I don't appreciate. I have always been interested in the paranormal and going ghost hunting, as me and my friends call it anyway. This story takes place on an October night in 2005, almost 15 years ago now. We had gathered at my dad's house for a party. He lived way out in the country in an old farmhouse. We decided to drive up the road to an old cemetery because one of my friends showed up with a Ouija board. I said we weren't going to use it in my house, but I was game to use it elsewhere. About six of us piled into the vehicles and took off. When we got there, we set the Ouija board up on an old concrete barrier that surrounded the entrance of the cemetery. For context, the cemetery was set on a hill surrounded by cow pastures, fields and trees and across the road stood a white church. There were two security lights that lit up the church area and the entrance to the cemetery. There was one more security light that lit the field, next to the only house for about two miles. We all stood in a circle, planchette in the center and hands on it. My friend led the seance and asked if there was anything in the cemetery with us. At first, nothing happened and we all stood still and quiet. Then, the planchette slowly moved towards yes. Immediately, we start accusing each other of moving it, of course. But everyone swore they didn't. An eerie feeling fell over us as the planchette moved back to the center of the board. About that time, we heard what sounded like wind at first, but then began to get closer, and it sounded like footsteps of multiple people running in circles around us. We were all wide-eyed, looking at each other when someone said out loud, I'm out. Another person said, we have to tell it by, or the spirit will follow us. The leader of the group spoke to the board and said something along the lines of, we are saying goodbye to you. And the planchette quickly jerked to no. 
It was pretty obvious by how shocked we all were that none of us had done it. Mind you, the sound of the footsteps is still surrounding us. The planchette moves to the center and we say bye again, and again it moves to no and back to the center. This time we all say together, goodbye, we're leaving, and it slowly, agonizingly, moved to goodbye. We were relieved and took off running to the cars, which were parked by the entrance of the cemetery side of the road. Me and my buddy jump into the truck. Then I hear my friend scream, guys, I can't find my keys. She checks the ignition, her pockets, and all our friends check their cars and their pockets, to no avail. Everyone else here loads back into the truck, and we speed the three miles down the road to my dad's house. My friend searches her pockets, her purse, and everywhere, but couldn't find them anywhere. Eventually, someone takes her home, and she says she'll get her spare and get a ride back to her car in the morning. We were all too scared to go back and look for them that night. The next day, my friend searches the cemetery and never finds the keys, even in broad daylight. We haven't walked around the whole lot, and where we used the cemetery was very close to where we parked, which didn't leave much room for things to get lost. Me and several friends scoured the entire cemetery over the course of the next week, but never found the keys. My friend said she was 100% positive they were left in the ignition when she got out the car. It's where I left mine, and a common practice in the area, where I'm from, which, like I said, is pretty rural. This was by far the scariest, but not the only Ouija experience I've had. I have had countless paranormal experiences during my life. In the mid-1990s, I was a hospital corpsman in the Navy. My first duty station was Naval Hospital Beaufort in Beaufort, South Carolina. I was assigned to the Branch Medical Clinic, BMC, at Marine Corps Recruitment Depot, Paris Island. I have many stories from my time there, some paranormal and some not. At the time I was assigned to Paris Island, all incoming corpsmen had to do a two-week night duty, where we would man the phones and radios from 10 o'clock to 6 a.m. During this time, we would also tidy up the trauma room and the emergency treatment room, and make sure all handheld radios were on their charging bases and fully charged, and making sure the trauma bags taken out by corpsmen covering the recruit activities were fully stocked. The first few nights of my rotation were uneventful. About the fourth or fifth night, I came in to find the duty crew a bit spooked. I had been told on my first day of processing into my new duty station that the main hospital and Paris Island were haunted. Made sense to me. All the buildings were really old. Anyway, that one night I came in and the duty crew told me the radios had been weird the entire evening, but failed to go into any detail. I settled in for the night with some music playing softly in a book. After a bit, I heard one of the radios being keyed, like someone was pressing the talk button to create a noise. Certain that someone was messing with me, I went and checked the handhelds, and all were accounted for, and off. Nobody else used our frequency. Throughout the night, I would hear the radios being keyed, always in odd patterns. It took several nights of this before I recognized the patterns as Morse code, S-O-S, but no one was there. A few times, the television in the lounge would turn on and off. It would also change channel frequently. You would hear odd noises in unoccupied parts of the clinic. Most of the time, these noises came from the area where recruits came in for their immunizations and medical processing. This area used to be the trauma bay until the 1980s. Back in the late 1960s and 70s, no one sure when, but it was Vietnam era. It said that there was a recruit who was on fire watch one night and started experiencing shortness of breath and chest pains. He didn't want to wake anyone, so he waited for his relief to take over. Then he walked from 2nd Battalion to the BMC, about a mile and a half. 
He was unable to open the door and pounded on it, but no one heard him. And he passed away from cardiac arrest and wasn't found until next morning. That door is no longer used for emergencies and is supposed to stay locked. No matter how many times we would lock the door, it would not remain locked. Sometimes we would hear the door opening and closing in the middle of the night, but no one was ever there when we investigated. My last night on night duty, I had just finished cleaning up the treatment room. I was setting up chairs in the corridor for patients to sit on, when I saw movement out of the corner of my eye. I looked up and saw a tall, skinny recruit standing at attention towards the end of the corridor near a recruit processing and the door that would not lock. I called him out, asked what he wanted. He didn't appear. I called out again and there was no answer. I began to walk towards him and he vanished. That was by far not the last time I was ever on duty at night at the clinic. But luckily it was the last time I ever saw an apparition at the clinic. For years now, I've been interested in the paranormal. I would do investigations with friends for years and even helped out a paranormal group from time to time. But my best encounter was when I was in the military. I was stationed at one of the army bases in the States and wouldn't have lots to do on the weekends. So one day I was really bored and brought myself a Ouija board, which was a big mistake. But I was a skeptic and needed to know. So I would do it with friends mainly. And nothing major happened except we would have the mover go by quickly. Several times we got responses, but the red flag should have been there when we got the response from Zozo and Mama. But then I started seeing stuff. The first time was when we used it in the center for events and volunteering. Nothing major happened. But then one night while volunteering, I went to sit in the giant room for conferences just to think. The middle lights were on and the front and back ones were off and I was just sitting in the back. At some point, this man suddenly walked from one side of the front of the room to the middle front. I was about to ask if he was there for volunteering, but then I realized that he came from where there was no door. Then it looked at me in the eyes and there was a shine in it like an animal's eyes. And I just took off and ran. I went back in a little while later, but there was no one there. You would think I would stop using the board, right? No. I used it in my room with a friend one time. And afterwards, one night while sleeping, I opened my eyes and looked at a silhouette of a man standing at the far corner of my room. It then started walking towards me. And as I began shaking my head, it was gone. The next night, I put a movie on in my portable DVD player and I slept no encounter. After a while, I turned my player off to sleep. That night I woke up again, when a young woman's figure was right near me by my bed. She began to reach for me and I shook my head and she too was gone. The remaining nights in that barrack, I kept that thing playing. Before I left the military, a few friends and I used the board one last time in another hangout place that was said to be haunted. Nothing happened to us, but a friend who was also a volunteer in the hallway said that she heard three loud hissing sounds and three laughters in her ear. She never went back there. Since my experience, I haven't touched a Ouija board since, though it's still in the box of my room. Some part of me wants to throw it out, but I've heard stories of people burning it or throwing it out for its return. Since then, I haven't had a true experience, but I do have that player playing every day while I sleep. For those of you wanting to play the Ouija board, do realize when you play it, you're going to be opening a door to something you don't know or couldn't possibly understand. I got lucky. I work night shift at Walmart. My shifts are always from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m except in the first few months of the year when they're cutting back on hours and I sometimes start at 11 p.m. and leave at 6 a.m. Late last year, around September, when the weather was still nice outside, I went into Walmart during the day to buy some groceries. 
I had a few things in my basket and was walking out from the back of the store towards the self-checkout area. I noticed, out of my peripherals, that a man, probably in his mid-twenties, a little taller than me and wearing a baseball cap, was approaching me from the other side of the features, those promo displays that sit in the middle of the big aisles. When he was done, he started talking to me, like we were acquaintances. I see people I know here all the time when I'm here. Oh? I asked, assuming he'd seen me in the morning while I was working. Yeah, it's weird how every time I come here I see the same people all the time. He kept rephrasing himself, and I didn't really know what to say. It was pretty awkward. He kept making small talk, as I didn't stop walking to the self-checkout, and was kind of just going along with the conversation like you do when some random person is talking about the weather. Now that I look back on it, when he told me he sees the same people all the time, I thought he looked a little familiar and assumed he was a vendor and worked some mornings there, and I mistakenly mentioned I worked there and also see the same faces. Then he told me to have a nice day and I checked out and went to my car dismissing the interaction. A lot of fellow employees greet me at Walmart when I go there during the day, so I didn't think much of it. Then it got super weird super fast. I was just leaving the parking lot and the exiting road splits into a left only lane and the other a straightaway. I was turning, stopped, when this white Ford Explorer pulls up next to me and beeps loudly. I was already turning, but looked in my rear view and sure enough it was the guy from earlier. I recognized his face and baseball cap. He sat at this stop, watching me pull away. All right, a little weird, but he's probably just being friendly. When I got home, I told my boyfriend and he immediately thought it was strange and then said I was wrong for even engaging in conversation with this man because sometimes some guys can get the wrong idea. My boyfriend also works with me on my shift, but his car has a blown head, so we've just been using my car to commute back and forth from work. So one night I don't work, my car is still there if he works. Keep in mind that as employees, we aren't allowed to park close to the store. We are limiting the parking at the far end of the lot or in front of the other stores in the shopping center. I have a typical spot. I always park in front of the AT&T place, which is next to the gym, which is next to Walmart. About two months ago, my boyfriend said he went to walk out the car on break and saw a white Ford Explorer parked next to it, with a guy sitting within it. When he saw my boyfriend, he left. This happened again in the same month, except my boyfriend was sitting in the car, and the white Ford Explorer drove up to Walmart, then passed my boyfriend staring at him. Then last month, I was driving home from work. It was barely 7 a.m., still pretty dark outside, and I was cruising down the highway towards the exit for my town. There was a car following two lengths behind me. We were both doing the speed limit, nothing abnormal. And suddenly this car begins to speed up, gets in the fast lane as if to pass me, but slows down so that we are neck and neck. The driver turns on his interior lights, waves at me and then speeds off. It was the guy in the white Ford Explorer. I just stared at him bewildered. I didn't know what to think. Then it dawned on me. He knows where I work. He knows what my car looks like. It's pretty distinguishable even from the back. I have sharp things along the top, decals, mud flaps, etc. He probably was waiting for me to leave work and then followed my car when I left. Thank God he didn't follow me home because I never would have realized it. I was totally unsuspecting when I walked out to my car alone. Now, what happened a few days ago is why I'm even sharing this. I think this is when it started to escalate. It was a typical night. Both my boyfriend and I worked along with our co-workers and friend called Mark. When Mark works, we always park next to him so we can talk on lunch and breaks with the windows rolled down. Mark parks further away from the store, pretty much in the middle of nowhere. We finish up for the night, clock out, and Mark heads out to his car while my boyfriend and I buy some stuff to make for dinner. We check out and head to the car. Mark is still there, which is unusual for him 
since he books it out of there like a bat out of hell every time his shift is up. Hey man, did you get my text? He calls out, smoking a cigarette. No, let me check my phone. My boyfriend pulls out his phone and I see a pretty long unread text from Mark. Pretty much, this weird guy came out of nowhere and was touching and looking at the inside of your girlfriend's car, Mark says. My immediate thought was, some randomer likes my car enough to come up and touch it. Weird, but okay. Like he just walked up and started touching the fins and looking inside. Then when he saw me sitting there, he asked me about the decorations. I told him I didn't know anything about them, and he told me to have a nice day. We immediately started checking for damages, slash tires, etc., but there was nothing. We get in the car, and the three of us just sit there, contemplating the reasoning behind this. The Ford Explorer guy had almost slipped my mind. His encounters were a month or so apart, but then I started thinking about him again. There were two cars parked near us. A white 2010 Pontinac G6. And surely enough, a white Ford Explorer. Up until this point, I didn't know the make of the car he drove, but I knew it was definitely a white SUV. Mark said he came from the direction of those two cars, so unless he walked to Walmart at 7am, one of those cars was his. The Explorer was facing the opposite direction and I quickly wrote down the number plate. I started asking Mark what the guy looked like. About your boyfriend's height, kind of a gangster looking guy. Keep in mind I've only seen this guy once when he wasn't in this car which was four months prior. I had sounded right, but I didn't really know. We decided to sit there and wait until this guy came out and confront him. Just as we were about to give up and leave, the guy starts walking our way out of Walmart. He was wearing a black hoodie, dark jeans, and a camo bandana. When he saw us, he put on sunglasses. Both of us looked towards Mark. Is that the guy? No, no, that's not him. Mark shook his head. The guy walks into the Explorer, sits in the driver's seat and lights a cigarette with the door open. After he closed it, I looked back at Mark. Are you sure that's not him? Yeah, it's him. That's the guy, Mark nodded. Explorer guy starts his car and looped around our car, staring at us, then looped again to the exit of the parking lot. Mark said he didn't want to tell us it was the guy because he didn't want my boyfriend to lose his job. I'm pretty sure Mark would have told us if it was the guy, then some stuff would have gone down. I'm pretty positive now that this guy has been stalking me. For how long, I don't know. I'm starting to think the guy drove to Walmart. I want to assume to buy something, since he walked out with nothing. Saw my car, parked next to it, then realized while he was casing my car that Mark was sitting there. So he asks Mark about the shark fins to try and make him think he was just interested in how it looked, and not being completely shady. And creep the hell out, but I have his plate number. The morning before we left work, my boyfriend bought me pepper spray, and I'm now parking elsewhere and I'm gonna start asking co-workers if they'll take me to my car in the mornings when I'm alone. I don't know what I can do, or if anyone would take this seriously because he hasn't tried anything yet. Sadly, I'm a pretty dainty girl, too brave for my own good, and I couldn't fight my way out of a wet paper bag. But I don't think this is over yet. Last night I was stocking yogurt alone at around half midnight, when I hear, excuse me, from behind me. Thinking it was a typical customer question, I turn around while politely replying, Yes? When I fully turned, it took me a moment to realize who was approaching me. Stalker. I know that my facial expression probably spoke volumes about my fear for a little while, but I didn't want to alarm or upset him, so I kept calm and spoke to him like I would any other customer. I'm not a stalker or anything, he prefaced. But I was just wondering where you got those decorations for your car. I see it a lot and I'm curious. I got them off eBay. Before I could finish, he interrupted me trying to keep the conversation going. Do you know what they're called? Pretty sure they're called diffusers because they're meant to diffuse airflow on the car. I got them off eBay for $20 the whole set. Oh, okay, thanks. Have a nice night. He smiled and walked away. 
What the hell? I'm not a stalker or anything. Yeah, dude, you are. I think I was in shock because there was no way I should have been that calm and nonchalant while talking to him. I know for a fact he was just trying to cover his ass since we pretty much caught him red-handed that day. I really hope I never see him again because he knows we're on to him. I live with my parents in a really small village in Europe. Our house is quite big and directly attached to my grandparents house, which is basically a big house cut into two. And the house next to theirs are my aunt and uncle's house. So yeah, we all live really close together and often pay each other random visits. On top of that, my grandparents front door is always open during the day. So me and my cousins can come in whenever we want. Since it's a small village, we know basically everyone and we're not too scared to leave the door open. People always have to walk across the whole garden to reach the front door, so it's quite safe and hidden. So now one day I was home alone because my parents were working and I didn't have any classes. My grandpa, uncle, auntie and cousin were also working, so it was just us two. My grandma was chilling in her kitchen, which is a little square room in the corner of the living room, which is a bigger square room. So when you walk from the kitchen to the entrance of the house, there's a part of the living room that you don't see. Suddenly my grandma heard the front door open and close. My family and I usually yell greetings when we enter so we know they're here. But she heard the door and nothing else. So of course she stands up and calls out for my dad and then my uncle, but nobody answered. She starts walking to the entrance to see if maybe she left the door wide open or something. But as she walked away from the kitchen, she hears a creak behind her. Now remember the part of the living room I talked about, the one you can't see when you're walking away from the kitchen? Yeah. Well, there you find a huge Narnia style wardrobe. When my grandma turns around, she sees the wardrobe door wobbling a bit, like if it wasn't completely closed. She gets closer to realize someone's hiding in it. She starts yelling at the stranger, asking him to get out. He does and stands awkwardly for a few seconds. My grandma is this small little lady and the guy was way taller than her. She didn't really know what to do at this point. She asked him what he was doing here. And after hesitating a bit, he said he thought this was a restaurant and got confused. Lol. My grandma told me that he kept looking around the room and it looked like he was trying to find a weapon. For some reason, my grandma walked towards him while asking him to leave, probably trying to intimidate him. And he began running to the front door, pushing my grandma since she was in his way. But thankfully, she didn't get too hurt while falling. She then closed the door, called me to tell me to do the same and waited for my dad and grandpa to come home. When they did, they called the cops and made sure that no one else had been hiding in the house. The cops told us a few cases like this had been reported in the village around us. For most of them, the guy just came in since a lot of the people in this village left their doors open and stole stuff. But apparently an old lady in a similar situation lost her life from probably the same guy. So the cops told us that my grandma calling for two men when she heard the door open probably saved her life because the guy thought there was someone else in the house. I have had a number of paranormal experiences happen to me during the course of my life. My first experience was at my own home in Florida about six years ago. We had just moved about roughly a year before and the house was brand spanking new. We were the only residents ever to live here. My dad and his wife both went on a trip to another state and my brother was back with his dad 2000 miles away. I was completely alone in my two story house for two weeks. I've been home alone countless times and the first week was nothing out of the ordinary. But by the second, I was feeling uneasy with my surroundings. And you know that feeling that you get when someone stares at you and you immediately look and there's something locking eyes. 
That's the feeling I had when I was always throwing my eyes and head around the corner of my house or doors. I personally am not one to freak out nor be scared, so I didn't think much of it. I went to sleep that night like I normally would. During the night, I felt pressure on my bed. That same pressure when someone sits on your bed, it was enough to wake me up and make me look at that general direction. I thought it was my dad sitting on my bed, which is something he is known to do, and it would often wake me up. Perhaps it was him telling me he'd come home early. But when I opened my eyes, I saw nothing. It was pitch black. And for what felt like the longest two seconds of my life, I was just staring into a dark room. I could feel the side of the bed being pressed down. And all of a sudden, the pressure eased as if someone stood up. I started breathing heavily and jumped from a laying down position to my feet on top of the bed and tried to pull my light switch from my fan on. As soon as the light came on, could I notice that I was alone in the room. I was panting, feeling sick to my stomach looking around. I sprinted to the bathroom and locked myself in, putting water in my face and trying to comprehend what exactly I had just experienced. You can bet the rest of the week I was cautious around the house, since I was still feeling uneasy and skeptical. My uneasiness disappeared roughly two months after all this, and I never had such a strange experience again within my own home. My second experience was four years after the first. Me, my father and his wife decided to take a road trip. This time, we landed in Charleston, South Carolina, and my dad thought it would be cool to visit the Drayton Hall Plantation built in the 1700s, as it was so nearby. We're history nerds and love to visit old historical buildings, museums and cities, and we take our tours, so this wasn't a big leap for us. It was the middle of summer and easily 98 degrees and humid outside for the entire tour. It felt like we were in another, and the sunlight was just incinerating. As soon as the tour ended, we decided to leave, but one of the tour guides told us that down the dirt road of the property, if we look to our left as we drive, there is a modern plastic arch that if we walked through further into the property using the arch as reference and kept going straight, we would find ourselves in the old slave cemetery. She gave us a pamphlet about it and we left. Mind you, my family are non-believers and my father especially always talks about how the paranormal doesn't exist. We thought it would be cool to see an old 18th century slave cemetery. So we drove and parked our car on the edge of the dirt road, but my stepmother decided to stay in the vehicle as it was so hot and she had air conditioning. Me and my dad walked all the way to the location and got lost since it was taking me further into the forested area. And we expected tombstones and such on a clearing. But as we walked in, we read the pamphlet and it said the cemetery was actually a mass grave where hundreds of slaves are buried and that we should look out for the only market, which is this pair of tombstones that were put in recently of deceased people who wanted to be buried there as they traced their lineage to be that plantation. We eventually found the tombstones that we were now in because the area looked untouched and it just had this pair of modern tombstones that looked new in the middle of the forest, surrounded by this tree, which each one being about 12 feet apart from each other and sunlight peeking through the leaves. We walked around for 15 minutes talking and speculating where the slaves were buried and how big the area of the graves could actually be. Remember, it was hot balls outside and there was absolutely zero wind whatsoever. At one point, we found ourselves at the tombstones and decided to leave. My father started walking away as I read the tombstones for a solid minute or two. And I had this cold area in the back of my neck and the entire back of my right arm, and I could feel cold on my shoulder through my shirt. I froze in place for a few seconds, and it was extremely distinct, and there was absolutely no wind or gust, nothing. 
it was just as cold as ice. As soon as I looked at my dad and talked to him, he walked away. The cold disappeared, almost instantly. A few months later after this, I found out coincidentally in college about cold spots during paranormal investigations and completely blew my mind about it and made me rethink what was happening in the plantation. Ever since the second event, it's made me look more into the paranormal and I'm not sure if I'm a believer or not, but it certainly freaked me out. In late 2006, two strange events occurred on my first deployment to Iraq. A little background. The base we were on was near Iskandaraya. It was a four smokestack power plant on the Euphrates River. It was like the military just walled off a one by one kilometer box around it. At the time, I think there were 800 personnel on the base, not including the Iraqis that ran the plant. There were paved streets, stop signs, nighttime street lights. The enemy rarely tried attacking it with mortars or rockets because they didn't want to screw up their power. It supposedly powered one third of Iraq. When we first landed there on the LZ, we thought they dropped us in a town and not an FOB. It was different than what you expect an FOB to look like. Everyone stayed in what we called cans, tin two person units. In the northeast corner of their FOB, however, my small specialized unit stayed in two houses. In the southwest corner, away from most of the personnel, one of the houses was pretty generic. But right next to it, the other was a mini mansion, which we referred to as the Taj Mahal. It had about eight rooms, most with their own bathroom, including shower. There was a kitchen and a dining room too. It was decorated with marble floors, wood accents, gold chandeliers, and one nice carpet. The upper floor rooms had balconies that overlooked the Euphrates River but the windows were sandbagged off due to the line of sight across it. It was pretty awesome thinking back. The rumor was that Saddam used it when he visited the plant, but my guess was that it was just an exaggeration and it was used by visiting VIPs. So here's where it gets weird. Myself and another guy called John shared an upstairs bedroom. When the lights were off, the room was completely dark. One morning after we were both waking up, he asked if I saw who came into the room last night and used our bathroom, whoever it was. It didn't wake me and I'm a pretty light sleeper. John said someone wearing PT shorts, a tan undershirt, flip flops and red lenses came in and used our restroom and left without saying a word. The clothing description is what most guys slept in. The next morning we asked around and no one fessed up, which was weird because we're a pretty tight knit group and there was an abundance of working bathrooms in the Taj. So a few weeks or maybe months later, it's pretty much the same scenario. John and I are asleep in the middle of the night in a pitch black room and I'm awoken by a medic who's calling my name, who's clear as day in a pitch black room. He says, Hey man, they need you downstairs with a huge grin on his face. I'm awake and my eyes are open and I respond with what's going on. Mid sentence, my medic just completely disappears and I shout, which wakes up John, who I tell what happened. Nothing like that has ever happened since. Same deployment. One night there was a legit UFO sighting on multiple bases reported and I actually saw it. The only way I could describe it, it was like a cone shaped light in the sky pointy side down. It was like a high powered flashlight was hovering above it, 500 feet pointing straight up. You couldn't make anything out besides the off white cone of the light. No clue, whatever came of that. All my life, I've been told I'm special and that I have abilities and to trust my intuition. I always have, 
and there have been many times where I've encountered supernatural entities. As a toddler, when I would be at my grandparents, I'd spend hours in my grandparents' bedroom in the corner, looking at the window and talking to my deceased great-grandfather Jack. I don't recall what I would talk to him about, but this did scare my family quite a bit, as I knew things from my conversations with him about my family that happened before I was born. This went on for years every time I was at my grandparents' house. When I was around 10, I got up in the middle of the night near Christmas Eve to go to the restroom, and halfway there, something caught my eye. I saw the black silhouette of something, or someone, hiding behind the archway. I could see a big beard, and it was taking deep breaths, slowly. I thought it was my father and said, Nice try, I see you. But there was no response. Just the slow, deep, and constant breathing from this dark figure with a large beard. I started to feel an overwhelming sense of dread that made me feel sick, and I dropped to my knees. Whatever this thing was, it looked malicious, and the energy from it was affecting me physically. I looked back up to confront it, but it was gone. It had vanished, but I was still very physically sick for the next few hours, as its residual energy remained. Sometime later, when I'm 18, I'm in my bedroom, AC off, windows closed. It was a still night, and there was no drafts in my room. I was browsing the internet on my iBook, and all of a sudden I had this pain in my head. It felt as if I'd been hit by something at the back of my head, and started to make me feel the same type of dread that I felt when I saw and felt the entity when I was 10 and also made me feel like I was being watched. I began to look around my room to see if there was anything in it. I couldn't see anything like I did when I was 10, but I could feel it. The level of dread I felt was no way near as intense as when I was 10, and it didn't make me feel weak and physically sick, but it did make me feel ill. I then saw the dream catcher hanging over my window start to move. It moved slowly and gently at first, but then it became faster and more violent. It built up speed, moving back and forth over a few minutes, until it was being so violently moved that it ripped off the wall above the window and flew across the room. After this, the feeling quickly lifted, and I assumed the entity had left. In my early 20s, I encountered the most malicious entity I'd ever felt. I'd moved into a new house, freshly built, and at first, things would be out of place or moved, and I just thought it was me, as I've always been a scatterbrain. The first time I saw it, I was in my ensuite, and I got the most intense chill down my spine, and every single hair on my body stood on end. I didn't feel dread this time. I felt what I can only call pure hatred and rage. There aren't quite words to describe it, but that's as close as I can put into words. That's when I saw it, in the ensuite mirror, that just outside the door, there was the darkest silhouette I've ever seen. It was darker than the darkest night, and it wasn't in an unlit hall. All the lights were on, but it was as if it was absorbing all the light coming near it. I could also see black, tiny orbs floating around it. Due to the rage and fear I was feeling from it, I wasn't scared or sick. I was furious, screaming at it. What do you want? What are you? I picked up a bottle of aftershave and threw it at the entity. It went through it and shattered the mirror behind it as it faded away. Not instantly disappearing in the blink of an eye like my previous experience, no. It just slowly dissipated into nothing. Over the next two years, I continued to randomly see this entity. There'd be months between sightings at least. I'd always see it in only two areas of the house, the kitchen and the ensuite. I'd always feel these feelings of hatred and rage every time, and the chills down my spine would become more intense. I could feel this thing wanting me dead. I tried to communicate with it, but it never would respond or show any sign of wanting to communicate. I'm a pagan, so I tried some rituals to no avail, and as a last resort, 
I decided to try a spirit board. I performed the protection circle ritual and wore protective crystals and started at 3 a.m. I lit six candles in a circle around me and asked for any spirits with me to speak up through the spirit board. And the planchette started to move. W E C U. The chill returned and all my hair stood on end. After I read that, I was terrified. I looked up and was in shock and couldn't move a muscle. It wasn't just the one pure black entity. There were six of them, side by side watching me. I opened my mouth to ask what they wanted, but before I could make any words out, the candles blew out and the salt protection circle was blown away in a gust of air breaking it and I was violently pulled by my feet and dragged out the circle while screaming in terror. The entities weren't touching me, they were watching me. Nothing visible was pulling me. I was dragged out my lounge room and towards the garage. And as I was pulled through the garage internal door, I smacked my head on the concrete floor and passed out. When I came to, my head was pounding and my head was bleeding severely. I remember what happened and my flight response kicked in and I got up and ran as fast as I could to the front door. I ripped the door open and got into the car that was on the street and started it before I put it in gear. I looked back and the figures were watching me from the front bedroom window. I put the car in gear and floored it. I never returned and had movers move everything to a new home. The entities didn't follow. There is a spirit in my new home though, but I believe it's my great grandfather. And every now and then I smell the strongest cigarette smoke and I feel loved. I believe he's watching over me in my new house. And I've never experienced anything that's so malicious and plain evil like I did with those six entities. And I knew they wanted me gone. But why? I'll never know. Not that I wish to know. This happened to my friend Simone a while back. She got into a relationship with a guy who she adored. He constantly doted on her. He had money and came from a line of it, but that didn't make their relationship any more stable. After the honeymoon period of about three months, things start to go off the rails. She couldn't come hang out with the girls anymore. There was always an excuse. She was always busy. We would often go to the movies together, just us two, but even these would be canceled. And I was her best friend. She started telling me that she didn't want to speak to me that much anymore, but her boyfriend was consuming a lot of her time. Nonstop texts, asking where she was when she was at school. It became really infuriating. She even had to quit her job as a nanny of these two adorable children because the guy became concerned that she may just fall in love and sleep with the husband. Really messed up stuff. After a while, I actually went round her house and spoke to her mum about it. I felt like it was the best thing to do. She wasn't in a good place. And after a good chat and staying over for dinner, crying and falling asleep together on her bed, we agree that the best course of action would be to tear off the band-aid and let this guy go. It took her about a month, but she dumped him. She finally saw how manipulative he was being and how it's not normal to try and control your partner's life. But then the stalking began. He started sending her gifts, all of which she refused. Then following her, she got a new job working at a supermarket. She'd be followed home in her car by her ex. When she got home, he'd usually just drive on and she began to get really annoyed. She had ceased contact with him about three months ago at this point. And she started messaging her again, demanding why he was still following her, that they were broken up and that he should just get over it. He said that he still loved her and that he would not relent until they were together again. He didn't stop saying this and said that he needed to make sure she got home safely. 
It was his number one concern because he loved her, that she was his soulmate. As you can imagine, this went down really well. So well, in fact, she ended up getting a restraining order, which didn't do much until they tried to get further police involvement. At which point, he finally got the memo that perhaps it's best to let sleeping dogs lie. And that's how the story ended. But it was a very challenging year. Thankfully, Simone is now with the lovely guy. When my husband's father passed away back in 2012, we inherited so many antiques and family heirlooms from him. One of which is this giant old wooden wardrobe, about eight feet tall and five feet wide, which was made by my husband's great great grandfather. Since it was so huge, we didn't really have room for it in our house and kept it in our garage. We call it the Narnia closet. Before my son was born, I used to go into the garage to smoke weed every night. I'd be sitting out there, and without fail at some point, I'd get that strange feeling of the hair rising on the back of my neck. I'd look over at the Narnia closet, and the door would slowly start to swing open. It creeped me out so badly that I always would go to close it, then run back inside. It literally would happen every time I'd go there by myself. We have a pool table that kind of is a man cave set up in a garage. So our friends would frequently be hanging out with us, smoking and drinking. Not once did the wardrobe door open when I was with other people. I later asked my husband and my sister-in-law if they had ever witnessed the door coming open by itself. And they looked at me like I was crazy and said they had never seen that happen before. I checked the latch so many times and it was actually really sturdy. Not like it could just pop open at any given time. One afternoon I was out smoking and like clockwork, the door slowly creaked open. At this point I had enough and was scared. I lost it a bit and screamed something like, you need to stop opening the Narnia door. You're freaking me out. Please never do it again. And guess what? Since I said that about four years ago, I have never seen the wardrobe open by itself again. I moved to a new apartment at the start of last month. It's only got one room besides the bathroom and the kitchen and was fully furnished. The view from the balcony is stunning. However, there's also the graveyard of this small village I moved to that's literally around the corner. And I can see this charming graveyard from my kitchen window if I stand on my toes. I went there once because it happened to be the way I was walking as I was chatting with my boyfriend. It's a very beautiful place, well taken care of, with some noble graves and a very small church in the middle. It has no locks on the gate, so people can visit whenever they feel like it. The thing that kind of bothered me was the fact that the gates make this really annoying noise like they need to be oiled. After we got back from our walk, we never returned, but we kept speaking about it. At the time, we really didn't notice it, but my boyfriend was very nervous and seemed kind of scared. But I was also just enjoying the walk and looking around, looking at the graves, that I hardly paid attention to his mild discomfort. It was only a few days ago that he got really upset when he saw the grave of a girl who passed away this year in March, at the young age of five. Looking at him, you wouldn't really expect him to be upset by a mere grave. I spoke to him about it, until we changed the subject as he got sad, and he eventually went home. Fast forward to yesterday. I woke up pretty late since I was staying up late, doing the laundry, sorting out clothes, and looking at things I needed to get rid of. I know for a fact that I cleaned the apartment to its peak so that there was no possibility of garbage and no dirty dishes or anything. When I came back home yesterday, I discover a puddle. I thought my mind must have been playing tricks on me, or maybe the floor was reflecting light from a lantern outside my window, but I touched it and smelt it and it was clearly water. When I looked up to the ceiling, it looked fine and was dry 
no leaks. So I brushed it off, thinking maybe I had just forgotten to clean something in my haste the other day. Hmm, that was weird, I thought. I did leave the house in a hurry after all. I was very tired, but just couldn't seem to fall asleep. I was restless and felt as if it would be wrong to go to sleep now. So I got dressed again and took a walk and stopped by the graveyard and sat on the bench in front of the gates. I remember being exhausted and my legs felt like they were pulsating. After a while, I went back home and the puddle had vanished. Everything was as it was before. As per habit, I lock my door twice at night. Last night, as I wanted to lay down to fall asleep, I heard something playing around with the door. It was 2 a.m. I was petrified and frozen under the blanket. I knew for a fact there couldn't be anyone there since my landlord lives in the apartment below and has been asleep at the time and the door to enter the house itself is always locked at night. I've heard how something or someone was trying to turn my doorknob and got more aggressive every minute. Even though it's the middle of August, I felt as if I were in a freezer because it became so cold. I could hear my door shaking and the doorknob was probably about to fall off at that point and then it stopped, slowly, but it somehow did. Not much later, I heard crying and I listened very closely when I heard someone whisper, Mommy, please let me in. I'm scared of the dark. At this point, I almost wept myself. I grabbed my phone, which I took with me and called my boyfriend. The crying stopped the moment I dialed his number and when he answered, I slowly crawled back into the living room before I finally started talking to him. Someone, please tell me how I'm supposed to sleep at night. A few years ago, my family moved into the house that we currently live in now. The first night I stayed in my room, I was having a difficult time going to sleep as I couldn't shake this weird feeling that had come over me. I'd been trying to sleep with my back to the closet and decided to get up and get water. But when I turned around, I became very aware of a face staring straight at me from the inside of my closet. The face looked as if it was a mask made of glossy white porcelain where the eyes and mouth should have been. There was nothing but empty holes. Somehow it was darker than the entire room, even without any eyes. I could tell this thing was looking right at me and filled me with a fear and unease unlike anything I've ever felt in my life until now. I jumped out of bed and managed to turn the lights on. But as I tried to run out of the room in the hallway, I found that I couldn't leave. And even though I could move freely in the room and the door was open, it was as though something was blocking the exit. As a last resort, I tried to call for my parents and my brother who were asleep downstairs, but couldn't muster any sound. It seemed as if the wind had been knocked out of me whenever I tried. I ended up hiding underneath the covers of my bed to get through the night. And for the next few days, I still felt as though something was there in my room until the feeling went away suddenly. I discovered a few weeks later that my grandmother had secretly prayed over the room after hearing that I had told my mother the day after this experience. Surprisingly, I think this may have had an effect on whatever was there. I've not seen the figure in my room since then, nor have I had another experience like that, though I have caught glimpses of it in the room across the hall, and even once while in a corn maze in October a few years back. I was wondering if anyone has ever experienced anything akin to this. I was a Navy sailor who went out to sea many times for weeks at a time. One of my jobs was being a lookout to spot boats, planes and things in the water or air pretty much and report it back to the ship. My lookout rotation could have me standing watch during the day or nights, sometimes both. 
and it was during the night where I was pretty afraid, especially if you were at the back of the ship alone. For anyone who hasn't been out in the middle of the ocean in the middle of the night, you should realize you see many more lights in the sky than you ever would in a city. And on Navy ships, they feel like they have very little lights on at night. So standing around at 1am feels very alien. And during the nights, without a bright moon to help with your vision, you may as well be on a different planet. There was this one time I saw a bright green color moving in the water slowly and it didn't know what it was. My mind told me it maybe was a USO or something. Eventually, I was told it was just plankton, but it sure was freaky for someone who wasn't aware of the phenomena. Another time me and another guy were standing watch together and I decided to just look up during 2am and see what I could see. And when I looked at the midnight sky, I could see meteors streaking across it. A few times there were bright lights moving out the way, maybe satellites, who knows. But I stared at it for a good 20 minutes and at about 15 minutes, slow moving lights in different areas of the sky, perhaps very far apart, started moving either way. Those were the few times I saw for myself how vast space really is, and that there was just so many things unknown to humans that we have yet to discover. This story takes place in a cabin in Vermont. It was a small room with a lofted area for the bed, a wood stove for heat and no running water. Attached with a composting toilet pretty far away. Nestled into the mountainside on a dirt road, off another dirt road, both formerly logging trails. My girlfriend found the place on Craigslist and wanted to move into it together because in lieu of rent, we could provide eight hours of labor a week to the landlord. I like adventure and the wild setting. And I was nervous that if she went in without me, she would be in over her head. The backstory on the cabin is that it was built by a man with the initials DC in the mid 70s. He suffered from schizophrenia and lived in the cabin while renting out another on the property for income. Somewhere along the line, he had a couple in his rental property who couldn't pay the rent and wouldn't move out. And that upset him. While they were gone, he burnt their home, which he owned to the ground. In the fallout, their relationship ended and they drifted away. DC built another cabin, a shack really, two small rooms with a low ceiling, adjacent to the rubble and moved in. I assume that was so that he could rent out his larger cabin. But no one I spoke to about it could confirm that. Most of the history comes from our landlord who briefly knew DC and a college friend of his who still lives on the mountain in a shack made of plastic and tarps with a propane cooking stove for heat. He is a lovely guy and a beautiful artist who doesn't like talking to strangers. But he and I connected over our love of nature and the pursuit of freedom. The shack still stands on the property but the roof is full of holes and is terribly rotten. It is frankly questionable how a structure as unsound as it is stays up, but it does. The shack overlooks the cabin and can be seen looking out from the bathroom window and the southwest window in the main cabin. It was unearthly to see it in the moonlight. The story I'm about to share took place on November 18th of last year, roughly two weeks after my girlfriend and I moved in. Kaylee had some problems and still does. I loved her dearly, though at this point in time, we were inseparable. The day starts normally. She went to work. I stayed home and gave the dog a bath. A statty stopped by looking for her. Second time she was out and delivered a card. I texted her a photo and told her to get in touch without thinking. And that set her off. I had to go to work. So I sent her a message that I said I trusted her and would see her later. I went to work with the landlord. I mean old POS one of the bad yogi variety, and left my phone and my coat. We were bucking logs and splitting wood that day, which is warm work as the old saying goes. 
So I tossed my coat on the side and didn't hear my phone ring. When we were done splitting one, he needed me to help him drop off a car for his repair, as he needed my help because he has no friends and the place we were going to was some rando rustic shop because he thought he could make the guy work for extra cheap. On the way back, I finally take a look at my phone and there's the one message you never ever want to see. The note that says you'll lend your life. We get back to the mountain and I'm at a loss. My car has been sitting there since the day I bought it over because the battery is dead and it has no gas in it because I forgot my wallet the last time I drove it. And her car is a reliable one. And wherever she is, she isn't answering her phone. I tried calling her relatives to no avail. So I mentioned the predicament to my landlord and he cracks a joke that she's probably already deceased before covering up with a very hollow it's usually nothing. He says I can have a half gallon of gas from the can and he'll give me a jump, but that's it. I honestly didn't care because it was enough to get me moving and I was in no mood to be wasting energy. So I set out, jumper cables in the passenger seat, three bucks in my pocket for gas, which was literally all I had at that point, because you don't work for rent if you're flush with cash. And I white knuckled it to town praying with my whole soul that she would be all right. I drove to all our usual spots with no luck and went to the bar where her sister works in the hope of finding her. She wasn't working. So I gave the bartender my number and asked him to reach out to her saying that it was urgent. Then I went to Kaylee's work, which was babysitting and asked how she was when she left. Her employer told me she had left bitterly swearing that she was going to end her life. But she hadn't done anything because she didn't think it was important. Just think about that for a moment. Then a glimmer of hope. Her sister has a heads up, a single text message of the letter S. But after roughly five hours up against it, we knew she was still breathing. And you can't imagine my relief. So I went home and waited and kept texting her encouragement. Night fell and I was in the cabin alone, waiting. I'm a little bit of a poet and so I finally sent this poem. Sweet baby girl out on your own, who knows the way that will guide you back home. We love you, we miss you. Our beating hearts have flown out from our chests to seek our missing one. She came home a half hour later, staggered through the door and fell into my arms sobbing. She said that she had stopped three times on her way up to the mountain because she lacked the strength to return. But she said I had called her back. I asked her how she was and she said that she felt heavy and cold, like she'd fallen down a dark hole. She said she couldn't find a way out and that she had lost the light. I specifically remember her saying she felt like something was trying to swallow her and wouldn't let her go. Then she looked at me and said she thought something from the cabin or the mountain was attacking her through her Ouija board. At this point, I felt thoroughly up against it. Her Ouija board is over a 100 years old, one of the original boards made from a single piece of wood. I had seen it once or twice but didn't like it much because of my background. I'm Christian and strongly believe in the existence of demons and spirits and the like. And depending on who you ask, a Ouija board is like a direct door to hell. Her board is stored in a closet under the cabin, reachable only by a steep dirt path tucked in any one of a random assortment of boxes. The last time Kaylee had been down there, she very nearly fell on a pair of scissors. To put it bluntly, there were very bad vibes and they were strong. So I told her I would deal with it if she agreed to follow my instructions until we were done. She was nearly dead on her feet and agreed. The first thing I did was to climb to the loft and get my crucifix. It was a gift to me from a man I met walking my dog, passed down to him from his German grandmother who had it blessed by a Catholic priest. I have another story about the crucifix, but that's not for today. I set her on the couch and hand it to her with the order to hold it in front of her and to not say anything. My father is a pastor and my mother a devout. So I called them. 
I told my mother what the situation was, and she says, you can't exercise a board because it's inherently evil. To which I replied, I know, but I can drive away anything coming through it and bind its power. I asked her to pray for my protection and success, and she said she would. I cleared my desk so I had a place to put the board on when I got back. I laid my Bible on it to be ready at hand and put my coat on and looked at the front door. I didn't want to go out. I can't tell you how much I did not want to leave. The board made me uncomfortable on a good day. Now I had to go find it in a closet in the dark by myself with the full knowledge that it was harming my girlfriend. I put on the only headlamp we had, mustered my courage and stepped out. It was dark. There was a slight breeze and the area felt heavy. Imagine the feeling of resistance of walking in a heavy wind, but without the wind to justify the resistance. I shuffled down to the embankment to the closet, took a deep, deep breath and opened the door. The lamp only lit half the space, and I didn't enjoy that. Fortunately for me, the board was in the first box I opened. We kept it wrapped in a purple alpaca wool shawl with moons and stars on it that I got from the man that gave me the crucifix, with the intention of keeping it both tucked away and relatively place sated. The shawl was super soft, and the board said it should be cleaned with a silk cloth before use. Unfortunately for me, the shawl was half unwrapped, and the naked board was hanging out in the cold. I picked it up by the covered part and wrapped it up. I took one step and something happened. I say something because it felt like I stumbled, but I didn't. I was anticipating everything and didn't want to drop the board or anything. So I was moving slowly and deliberately, but I put my foot down and braced myself from falling over. The second step was the same. I can't really describe it because I didn't feel a hand or a shove and my feet didn't slip or slide, but my balance was all over. I carefully climbed up the embankment and went back in and set the board in the spot I had made for it. I unwrapped it, placed my Bible directly between me and it, sat down, put my hands flat on my desk and went for it. I tried to cast out the evil and bind the board with the most powerful, clear and distinct language I could. As soon as I was done speaking, the heavy feeling that had been lingering vanished. I wrapped up the board and asked Kaylee if it worked. She smiled and nodded, closed her eyes and said that she could feel the light again and the feeling of being trapped was gone. Now there's one last wrinkle I want to leave you with and I swear to you, it's true. The night before it all happened, I had a dream. In that dream, I ran onto a pier through the ocean, through a fence and the wind and waves were crashing to get to Kaylee and I carried her back as the storm winds howled and tried to throw us into the sea. When we made land and took shelter, I opened a door into a pillar and thrust her in ahead of me. Then I went in and found the room full of people in historical garb, some 1920s, some earlier. There were about 13, but this was a dream. I do remember clearly a little boy, newsy style, with thick blood coming down from his upper cap and a very haunting look in his eyes. I opened the door and pulled us both out of the room. And that moment was when I woke up. I met Carter at a convention. Right off the bat, he scared me. I heard rumors that he'd nearly been removed from the extremely liberal convention. But he seemed nice enough and lonely. So I decided to befriend him instead. Then I noticed that he was always nearby. When I was walking to my hotel, he was there. When I was eating lunch, he was there. When I was in my private group, he waited outside the door. When I went to meetings, he was there too and sat beside me. He usually either walked up to me and started a conversation, which ended in an awkward silence, or just stared at me from 50 yards away. I couldn't believe he was really following me. So I went to my hotel, disguised myself and went outside to see if he was there. He was, literally lurking in the trees nearby. He pressured me into giving him my number, so I gave him a fake one. 
He found my professional information and begged me to look over his work, to which I declined. He asked me if I'd be at a party. I lied and said no. He showed up anyway. Somehow he knew I decided to go. He always talked about how lonely and depressed he was and how I was a lifeline until on my way home from the convention. I had no service during the flight. He freaked out and spammed 49 messages until ending with, okay, fine, I'm gonna end myself now, just so you know, strongly implying that it was my fault for not answering him immediately. I told him to call 911 and then blocked him. He contacted me through Instagram, Hangouts, email and more, but I never replied. I asked the convention security to speak with him about his creepy behavior, and I was told to just switch off my phone. Fast forward a few months, I get an email from James asking me to look over his work. Not a big deal. I run a program specifically for this sort of thing. I agreed, since his email was very polite and well-worded, but he seemed pushy in a way I couldn't quite figure out. I ignored it, reviewed his work, and ceased communication. You know where this is going. A little while later, he confessed that it was Carter all along. He put all the blame on me and apologized in a horribly manipulative way, begging me once again to review his work. I never replied, and here we are. James slash Carter, let's never meet again. This happened to me when I was five or six years old in my old house. At the time, the house only had two rooms. So me and my brother shared a room while my mum and stepdad slept in the other. My brother was at a sleepover this night and my best friend Kylie slept over. She slept on my brother's top bunk. At around 3 a.m. I woke up. Kylie was still asleep and I was facing towards my wall. I turned over to my other side and looked at my closet door, and I clearly remember how scared I was when I stared straight at a tall shadow-like man on my closet. Of course, the first thing I thought of was Slenderman, and I still kind of believe it looked a bit like him. I got up nervously and looked out my window, which was directly across from my closet, to see if there was something outside casting a shadow. Lo and behold, nothing. I ran back to my bed, hid under my covers, and fell asleep. The next morning I told my friend all about it and she believed me. Of course, I saw this again last year. Me and Kylie had a sleepover at her house, and we were pulling an all-nighter. At about midnight, her parents were asleep, and we snuck downstairs, grabbed a box of Cheez-Its and Triscuits, and I went out of the living room to grab a bag of smart food that we left in the living room before we went up at 10. When I grabbed the crisps, I saw something from the corner of my eye. Of course, it was the same thing that I had seen years ago. I dragged Kylie out of the kitchen and showed her. At that point, we just went upstairs and binge watched Big Mouth. I'm currently serving in the army and I'm stationed in Hawaii in the Schofield Barracks. I had a long day and decided I'd have something to drink since it was early enough in the day that I could get to sleep and wake up sober for morning formation. Laying in bed, watching Reddit stories on YouTube when I fell asleep much earlier than I usually do by accident and thus not setting my alarm for the next day. Any person in the military can tell you that missing morning formation is a big no-no. So there's a lamp in my closet that was sitting on a shelf above my head level and has been there since I got my room. I suddenly awake to the lamp falling off the shelf and hitting the floor, but not scaring me. Like I said, I was just awakened by it. Thinking to myself that it's weird, but also remembering that I haven't set my alarm for the next day, I open my clock out and start setting them when out of the corner of my eye I see a wispy white figure walk past me. I quickly dart my eye to see it and poof, nothing there. Again, none of this scared me, 
as something like this usually would, and I found a comfort in believing it was a guardian angel walking to me to have me set my alarm, so I didn't get into trouble for missing formation. What did freak me out, however, is after I closed the door and went back to sleep, about two minutes into me laying back down, I heard a loud meow coming from the closet. I jumped immediately, turned on my lights and swung my closet door open to find nothing. Barracks do not allow pets or animals, and for those thinking maybe the lamp just fell on its own, there's no discernible reason it would have, as it's pretty far back on the shelf and hadn't been moved or touched since I got there about a month ago, and had never fallen before. This event occurred back in the beginning of October 2019, but let me give you a little backstory. A branch of my mother's side of the family moved from Illinois. They were actually all immigrants from England to the Pacific Northwest country. I currently live here, and back in the 1880s, to work in the mining and logging industries, at least three subsequent generations of the family moved here at the same time. A number of these family members were buried in a family plot, in a historic, large and still active cemetery on a hill overlooking the town that I live in. There are a total of five people buried in our family plot. My great-great-grandfather, Elijah Bird, buried in 1911. My great-great-grandmother, Emily Bird, buried 1927. My great-grandfather, Nigel Bird, buried 1940, son of the two mentioned above. My great-grandmother, Deborah B. Bird, buried 1991. And my great-great-aunt Sadie, buried 1902, aged 12. Now, to my story from October 2019. I was riding in the passenger seat of my husband's truck. We were driving to my brother-in-law's house. We were passing by this cemetery, and I have a great interest in my family history, so I've done a good deal of research about them, and that is how I know where many of them are buried. The family plot is located about 25 feet in front of the cemetery fence, and about 30 feet from the road that passes by the front of the cemetery, the road we were driving on. The plot is marked with a large headstone, and has the surname carved in large letters facing the road. It is very easy to spot. There are some bushes along a portion of the fence line of the cemetery, but they are not present where my family plot is located. On this clear October afternoon, as we were passing my family's plot, I looked out my window, as I always do if we're going by, and was surprised to see someone sitting on my family plot facing the large gravestone. I turned my head and body to see her as we progressed down the road, and when I finally got a good look at her, I saw her for around 10 to 15 seconds. I saw that she was small and female, in a white dress with some ruffles on the shoulders. To me it looked very old fashioned, like something worn during the 1800s, late. She was sitting with her knees pulled up to her chest and her forearms resting on her knees. I only saw her left arm. It was wrapped around her bent left leg. Her brown hair was long and as far as I could tell, was lying loosely down her back. I caught glimpses of what I thought were black boots on her feet. She didn't move at all while I was looking at her. I asked my husband if he saw a girl in the graveyard and he said no but he had been concentrating on the road. I told him I saw a girl sitting on my family's plot, and he just grunted and said it was weird. I thought a lot about it on the way to my brother-in-law's house, and while we were visiting we took the same route home, but by this time it was dark so I couldn't see anything in the cemetery as it wasn't lit. My mind went straight to Sadie, who died as a preteen and is buried there. She could have been around the same size as the girl I saw during her life, and could have worn something like that girl was wearing. I never have seen an image though of what Sadie actually looked like. My mother had a lot of old family photos from her side of the family, including two or three photos of passed away infants from the 1880s to 90s from my great grandma. So 
Lots of pictures, but none of Sadie that we know of. Safe to say I was quite creeped out by what I saw. It could very well have been a living person dressed up in Victoria era clothing. That does seem far more likely. But it's odd and kind of creepy nonetheless, just to be sitting on someone's grave, don't you think? I find it more disturbing that there was a living person using my family's grave as part of some dress up game, than for it to be a ghost. I'm the only one in my family that is descended from these people that lives in the entire county. Thinking about Sadie does make me a little sad. She passed so young. Child and infant mortality were very common back then and it is tragic. I have no information of what she died of. I just thought I'd share this because I've been thinking about this sighting lately and wanted to see what others think of it. Just over a year ago, I split up with a very abusive ex-boyfriend, Kieran. He would be physically, verbally, and otherwise aggressive, and seemed constantly paranoid of being emasculated. This progressed to being paranoid about me even earning as much as him. I tried to be clear that I saw him as an equal, but it didn't matter. He fell further and further into the philosophy that women are the root of all evil, if ever there was a living, breathing caricature of genuine misogyny, he was it. I'm not a fighter, and he hated it. As he put it, the silence, the open void hurts me more. He wanted me to fight back, but I never would. So he would go to greater and greater lengths to assert dominance over me in one way or another. One incident was so extremely violent and calculated that I eventually reported it to the police, and with the help of an off-duty cop, due to the nature of the assault, it went straight to Crown Court, which is reserved for the worst offences in the UK. Nothing came of it. No eyewitnesses. It wouldn't have gone anywhere. I pressed it no further. I just wanted it marked up to help any future partners build a case that puts him away if it ever happens again. This was the incident that tipped me towards making the decision to leave Kieran. It took some months, but I eventually did it. He made so many attempts to contact me that even the officers on my case raised an eyebrow. It was getting beyond borderline harassment. Long story short, this guy was not happy that he had lost me. He didn't care about my well-being. He cared about having me. I don't think I understand why to this day. Kieran kept vying for attention. He likes women of my political persuasion, and as I was known as an outspoken activist at the time, he began name dropping my messages to other women in the same political circles. I thought that maybe he didn't think we knew each other at first, but then he started messaging friends. I tried to be cordial with all former partners, including him. So when he messaged me asking if another activist we followed was still online, I told him she was. Big mistake. Within the hour, she DM'd me. She received aggressive messages from him demanding photos and then demanding an explanation as to why she wouldn't oblige, because Kieran was my nice ex. I quickly told all other young female activists at my university in my hometown and my local party associations. Almost all came back to me saying they had indeed received messages from him. He was hounded off Twitter by a friend's boyfriend and deleted his account. I know how that feels, and I feel bad for it, but I don't regret the act of warning my friends, especially the more vulnerable ones. But then a new account was made, Kieran May 97. I only noticed because the first notification I remember getting the morning after was that this account had followed me. It had a photo of Kieran and a few sunny tweets shared by my fellow followers about how he was new to Twitter and wanted some friends. I spread the warning to some people and blocked the account, but before long there was another. I did the same and blocked them too. My mother started messaging me in confusion, sending me screenshots from her own Twitter. Kieran had found her anonymous account and was asking her about beans she had bought the other day. Knowing the things Kieran had said about her to me, 
and possibly others. She was upset and creeped out beyond compare. I advised she blocked him and he would tire himself out eventually. But there's one thing that I need to mention. One night I was messaging friends, having a nice night in with the housemates. Then my WhatsApp ping. All of my family are on there as well as a few busy activist groups. So I didn't think anything of it. Because of all the activist groups too, I wasn't alarmed that it was an unsaved number that had messaged me. It was probably a colleague. I opened the message. The only thing there was, was a dark photo of a house with an upstairs light on. I squinted to try and see if there was a joke in the photo. Why would someone send me this? I could see a figure in the window hunched over, something small in their hand. I could see the end of the terrace, the hedges, the shape of the gate, the pebble dash, the light car out front. It was my house. I forgot my merriment and messaged my friends. The conversation completely derailed, understandably. We scrambled to figure out who sent this to me, but by the time the second picture came in, I already knew. I didn't even look at it. Most of my uni friends at the time were competitive weightlifters and they offered their house a safe refuge until I figured out what was happening. I sent a frantic, what are you doing to Kieran? And he began typing immediately. He had been waiting. Peeking, he replied. It was a joke. Can you see that shadow? I'm not a bloody peeping Tom. I thought it was a joke when you first scared me crapless, but now I can't make sense of it. Oh no. That was just me actually watching my neighbor's shadow eating a pot noodle for entertainment, as if I'd come for you. You know how I think better than anyone. I examined the second picture closely. It wasn't mine. It looked very much like it. He hasn't messaged me since. No communication at all. I still don't understand what the purpose of that whole exercise was. I stayed in my house and left in the early afternoon for a friend's place the next day. For months afterwards, I was very careful about letting my landlady, neighbors, and friends know I was coming home. The doors and windows are always locked. I really don't know how he thinks. I hope I never see him again. Picture this, you're in my bed. To the right of my bed on the wall is my closet. It doesn't have doors, just a curtain that I use to block it off except the curtain will move sometimes and reveal the inside of it. It's never bothered me until one night. I had a friend over and they fell asleep. I stayed up because I wasn't very tired. After an hour of being on my phone, I switched it off and turned to face my closet, which is when two circular red dots glared at me from the crack in the closet. I froze and tried to use one of my arms to slowly reach behind me and tap my friend awake. I guess whatever was in my closet noticed what I was doing, and I started to hear heavy breathing coming from there. I noticed the side of the curtain was moving in and out from the breathing. I started flipping out even more and turned around quickly to shake my friend awake. Right as my friend opened her eyes, she said, Don't look at it, then sat up and screamed. I don't know what to do, but I looked back at my closet and it was gone. I felt hot and dizzy. Then my friend asked if I was okay or why I woke her. I turned back to face her. And that was that. The story I'm going to tell you happened when I was little and is basically my mother and uncle's version. When I was four years old, I was really sick. I basically couldn't digest the food I ate. So my body had no defenses and I was sick pretty often. I never spent weeks on intensive care at the hospital. The thing is, no one knew what was wrong with me. For a year, three different doctors were trying to find out what was happening to me. They would make a lot of tests, even for rarer conditions, but they were always negative. My mother was completely desperate, and in her own words, I was going to pass before I could even figure out what it was trying to take me. So one day, my mom was with me at my uncle's house. He and my dad's brother and he live with his wife and the mum of his wife, who is also like a grandmother to me. 
So this old woman told my mom that she was beginning to think I was possessed by a spirit. I live in a place that has a lot of esoteric beliefs and traditions, especially followed by the older generation. She asked my mother if she remembered going to the cemetery while she was pregnant with me. At that moment, my mother remembered that she had gone to take flowers to her father's grave on All Saints Day. There's a legend here that if you go to the cemetery when you're pregnant or with a newborn baby, the spirits will try to possess them in order to live again. My mother and uncle threw me into the car to take me to a church known for such cases. My mum and uncle said I was screaming and crying the whole time in the car and that I didn't want to go. I didn't even know where we were going or why since they didn't tell me anything. My uncle was driving and suddenly we ran into a traffic jam. He tried to slow down the car and then he realized the brakes weren't working. He kept stepping on the brakes without the car responding until we were about to hit the car that was standing right in front of us. All of this and then in a matter of seconds, the car stopped completely inches from colliding. When we were already standing, the strangest thing of the trip had happened. They both felt as if several people from outside their cars were pushing the car and shaking it from one side to another. I was about to scream. Long story short, we arrived to the church. I didn't want to go in, but I finally did. I was crying the whole time. And when I got out and I was in a much better mood, my mum bought me donuts in our way to the car and I ate one and then puked. But it was as if I puked something with sand and texture, something completely dry. My uncle stopped the car and got out just in case I was going to keep going. Suddenly I did a strange sound like a burp, but it was way too loud and deep sounding for a four year old kid. The next day on Monday, one of the doctors called me. One of the tests was positive. They already knew what was wrong with me. How this all began was me being nice to the people who come to my local community library. I was a casual worker. Although people probably thought I was a part timer, as not only was I spotted behind the desk checking in and out books, but also on my laptop abusing the Wi Fi. This guy nicknamed Chesney was probably an influencer for the young adults, as he mainly skateboarded around and did whatever. He was never alone. I was a natural when it comes to customer service speaking and acting. So chances are I must have spoken to Chesney kindly enough. He thought I was interested in him or he became infatuated with me. I don't date anyone in or from my community. I explained to many people before that dating here would be full on Alabama. Chances are they could be my cousin through marriage or blood. It's disturbing as I'm Native American and can't even go west or south to date another guy because chances are they might also be a long distance cousin. While my time at the library was long, just to gain work experience, it did not last when Chesney asked me to hang out with him. I declined the first time, but it didn't stop. One day he asked for my phone number and I refused. I don't give out personal information like that. I have a low friend count. I'm not close to anyone who isn't within my immediate family. And my family can see BS as soon as it comes into their line of sight. Chesney then asked my supervisor for my number to give to him. How I came to know this is by the end of the day when we were closing up the library. My supervisor tells me that she'll keep an eye on him and that I should get home safely. I continue every day as normal very ignorant of the situation that was now starting to build. One day I was sitting in my cubby hole, as the patrons like to call it, and I started to notice Chesney would find a spot to sit where I would be in his line of sight. I ignored this until one day he came up to my cubby hole and hands me this Magic the Gathering card. He didn't say much, but I was disturbed. I'll be honest, something about him didn't seem right. The card had an octopus on it. And then right then and there, I placed the card down and gather up my things and leave. I didn't return to the library for three months, maybe even longer than that. 
this had taken place two years ago. I told my eldest sister about the incident and my family were worried. They wanted to know the guy's name. However, I did not want to know his name. I didn't see him being important to remember. I didn't see him again until a year later. I'm doing more casual work at the library and basically forgot his face until one day he comes in and was working at a computer. I never gave him a second thought. I was busy reorganizing and stacking the bookshelves. Then he printed off a paper and came up to me and asked, how do you get a job here at the library? My reply was blunt. You have to speak with my supervisor. I overheard my supervisor telling him he couldn't hand him his resume here, that he needs to hand it in over at HR at the band office. Never saw him again, as I got a job elsewhere. Two years later, about four days ago, I'm living my life as normal when my mum texts me. Hey, some guy's calling you and would like to speak to you. Is there no number to call back? Not my time. Eh, didn't call my number. Not worth a call back, mum. I just answered the phone. I said I'd just pass the message on. She gives me the caller ID. But, like an ass, I text her back saying the ID isn't familiar and there's no number to call back from. If someone wanted to speak to me, they would call or text me through my cell. Otherwise, it can't be important and I ignore it. I was sitting at my local Timmy's when my eldest sister calls me and tells me that I have a stalker. It shook me a bit, but another part of me was amused since I do have a tendency to think dark thoughts and that this could be a joke. My sister explained to me that my stalker wanted to meet with me and take me out to dinner, that he wanted to hang out with me. She wasn't saying this seriously, which is why I thought she was joking. I didn't know who this guy was, and I tried to place a name and face to whoever this person was. Things were starting to get a bit annoying when my mum and elder sister started to accuse me of giving out my brother's number to a stranger. Why the hell would I do that? I barely have a social life. Whose number would I be giving it out to? When I went home, I went over to my brother's house. My mum, who was staying there, said he just called. Now my family's on high alert. By reverse number searching, I got an address where the number was coming from. I wasn't taking this seriously. Whoever they are, they lived outside the res. Me and my elder sister went to the address and did a drive-by. My sister enlightened up the mood by making jokes, pointing out to random guys who were walking down the road saying, Oh, that must be your stalker. No, that one. Just saying, these guys walking around the road looked like your typical druggie or tweakers. Once we returned home, my amusement ended, as the accusation started up again, if I gave out my brother's number, being the concern. My elder sister asked, and demanded to know, but of course I had not done that. Then how did your stalker get it? She asked. Well, he either got it from someone who knows our brother's home phone number, or looked it up in the phone book, is what I concluded as I know for damn sure I never gave out anyone's number. Once I got home, I was annoyed, immediately grabbed my brother's handphone and went outside to call this guy. My sister was walking to my other brother, filling him in on what was going on. It didn't take long for the guy to pick up. You can guess who it was, Chesney. Chesney was the one calling my brother's home and asking for me. I immediately started to tell him my family isn't amused and that I wasn't interested. Even when I said no, he kept on trying to ask me out. So I asked for his full name, which he gave, and told my siblings who it was. It's not my fault for living under a rock. Turns out this guy's an addict, if not a loser. And I told my parents and they told me to not even think of dating him and to just go and leave him alone. Thanks, Mum and Dad. I don't date anyone from the res. I did do a Facebook search and of course he had to be a wannabe thug, honest about doing hardcore drugs in his post, and I love that he has German blood saying he's a Nazi, and a descendant of the Führer. Nice. Getting up, I went to my brother's house who was home, annoyed, and I couldn't find the phone on the cradle. I asked my brother who went 
to the incoming calls, pressed the number and handed it to me, which I immediately pressed call. And this guy didn't wait to pick up the phone. Chesney? Speaking. I was pissed and didn't use my customer service voice. That was gone. You will cease and desist from calling this number ever again, or I will get the police involved. This is a form of harassment. Uh, okay. I hung up. Furious. My mother said something about calling the cops, but he was calling my brother's phone, not mine directly, and he hadn't done anything threatening yet. But still, I really hope not to meet that guy again. Pathetic, worthless, and annoying. My name is Joseph, and I used to live in Folsom, California, the old part. My neighborhood friends were Rob, Kristen, and Robin. I'm on Natoma Street, and they were down at Sibley, Figuera, and Reading Street. Folsom's been around for ages. Used to be a mining town, gold coming down from Placer, El Dorado, and Amador. It would pass through on its way to San Francisco. So there are a lot of old churches and cemeteries on this side of town, and it's not uncommon to find bones while digging in your yard. Rob lived on Sibley and I on Natoma, and where these streets met are churches and cemeteries. Oh, and a small park in front of his house where we'd kick it. At the time, Rob was dating Kristen, and I had an eye for her friend Robin, which never panned out. But we still hung out as friends, and this is what happened to us one night while hanging out in a graveyard. We walked down Natoma and crossed Folsom Boulevard to hang out in the cemetery where Rob had seen a tombstone with a motorcycle engraving and had the most wonderful idea to whip out a Ouija board and try to speak with the guy. I always thought these things were nonsense. It says Parker Bros on the box, so to me, it's about as scary as playing Monopoly. That night, the weather wasn't great, but not too bad, cloudy with a breeze, and it took forever to get the candles lit. We all had to open our jackets and huddle up to prevent the wind from blowing out the lighter. So it's set up on the guy's tombstone, candles for effect, and we begin. Stupid questions, giggles, the, hey, I know you guys are moving it. Nobody was taking this seriously. Until the weirdness started. First, the wind picks up, and the candles don't go out. Easy enough, trick candles. The ones for birthday cakes that are hard to blow out. But these weren't those. Then the rain begins to drizzle. The board isn't really getting wet, but it is coated in wax, right? No, I don't think that was the reason. I mean, raindrops didn't land on the board at all. We started getting pelted by rain, the board and candles remained as they were. I wish that was the end of it. I was scared, as were the girls, but Rob couldn't be more excited. Then someone says, what's that? There are lights at the cemetery, kind of like street lights along the fence and driveway, and we could see something moving about 50 to 60 yards away. A silhouette, a shadow moving from tree to tree, getting closer. It moved really fast. At about 30 yards, it passed under a streetlight, and we could see it was just a blob of black, and we all ran. Rob's fastest, and I'm behind the girls, keeping that thing over my shoulder following the star on Rob's starter jacket. When running in the dark in between tombstones and trees, making our way to the front gate, when I felt something grab my leg. It was the chain that ran along the top of the posts at the driveway, but I thought it had me when I looked front to see where I was going. I broke the chain and wrapped around my leg. I ran across Folsom Boulevard with one of the posts still attached, and when I stopped to pull it off, I realized that I had wet myself. I don't remember if we met up in the park or if we just ran all the way home, but I'm glad that that thing didn't cross the street. I'm sure for them, that was that, but it didn't end for me. I ruined a pair of jeans that I'd have to explain. I had a deep bruise around my throat I'd have to explain, but what I couldn't explain was the damn Ouija board in my room. We ran. I didn't go back for it, and neither did they. But I'm crapping myself because it's sitting on my bed. I'd rather get caught with a dime bag or a dirty magazine than this. 
This is totally forbidden in my house, and now I had to hide it until garbage day. I took all the garbage bags out of the can and put it on the bottom and stacked the bags on top. Job done. Nope. At some point, it's back in my room. We had a cord of firewood on the side of the house, so I wedged it in tight and stacked logs on it, totally hidden till garbage day, and managed to get it out the can before anyone could notice. But then it was back again. At this point, I'm terrified. I threw it in a field, hid it in a friend's house to no avail. My last attempt to get rid of it worked. I took my nan's rosary and a few things precious to me, but worth it. Buried it in the graveyard of the old church downtown and said out loud, this is holy ground and if anyone can hear me, please keep this thing away from me. I don't know if it stayed put, but it never came back to me. I'm still fearful of these things. When I'm watching paranormal TV shows, I'll fast forward or skip an episode because I don't even want the image on my TV. Since then, I've seen stuff that will make your hair fall out and fracture your sense of self, or maybe just break your soul. But perhaps it's only me. Ever since I was younger, I have always been drawn to places where the dead dwell, such as local cemeteries, columbarium and mausoleums. I've always had a strange sensation when stepping foot inside cemetery grounds, particularly within indoor mausoleums. It feels like a chill coupled with an increased spiritual pressure, as if gravity is intensifying. This feeling is always spot on as soon as I would enter a cemetery or mausoleum. I would have thought that I would want to avoid places like that, especially when I'm not visiting my deceased loved ones. However, I find myself subconsciously drawn to these places. Just driving by local cemeteries slash memorial parks, I'm subconsciously drawn to enter, even if I express no intention whatsoever. I thought it would perhaps be my emotional response to entering a place of the dead. Therefore, I asked my friend to conduct an experiment where I would deprive myself of my senses i.e. wear a blindfold as well as earmuffs. He would then drive me around to local places, grocery stores, libraries and the cemetery, and then tap me when he stopped. I would then identify if I were in the cemetery or not. Shockingly, I was able to identify whether the places were cemeteries or not based off of this feeling, or increased gravity as I call it. As a scientific individual, I am highly skeptical of the supernatural, However, I have not been able to discern why I have this particular sensation, neurological, spiritual, emotional, or otherwise. What is most baffling to me was the ability to sense spot on and more than once and accurately, whether I was in a cemetery, even by blocking my sound and sight. Me and my friend were doing night shifts for a production at school, setting up the stage, etc. for the production later in the month. There were two janitors helping us with the setup, one of which went home for the night, both of which have a key to a closet. One of the usual school closets surrounded by rumors said to have the bodies of children inside it. However, it just has the security monitors and broomsticks. The security cameras are always turned off, and are just for sure. I needed the bathroom, so being a wuss, me and my friend went to the restrooms heading past the closet door as we went in. It was a little bit open, something that's a bit out of the ordinary, but we ignored it and thought nothing of it. I greeted my friend as I came out of the stall and noticed another unordinary thing. The security camera outside the toilet was on. Being veterans of the school, I knew it was something to do with the open closet. Maybe the janitor turned the cameras back on. It was night shift after all, but it wasn't like them though. So we headed back to the hall to finish for the night again, passing the closet door as we went. We asked the janitor if he knew anything about the open door. He knew nothing about it. He said he would ask the other janitors in the morning. We finished for the night, leaving him to lock the closet and the gates we left from. The next day was pouring with rain. This time both janitors were there 
agreeing that neither of us had used the closet in well over a week. My friend and I being suspicious did the same thing as we did the previous day and checked the door as we went down the hall towards the restaurant. But this time it was wide open. A wet umbrella hung dismally from the center chair surrounded by three monitors all turned on controlling the security cameras. I sent my friend to tell the janitors and stayed behind, looking at the room a bit more. The window to the left of the chair was open. It was small, but just large enough to fit some of the small stature through it. After a while, the janitors came and saw the umbrella and called the police after realizing that no one but them could enter the room and the umbrella didn't belong to any of them. A week passed and I was freaked out by the incident and barely slept at all. The police investigation told the school that someone did in fact use the window to get into the closet room and most likely use their monitors to check who was in the building. But they never managed to find the closet man, nor his motives for why he was in the school. Somewhere in 2007, I was stationed in Camp Pendleton, specifically Camp Horner. I was acting as officer of the day. The command post is a long building about half the length of a football field with a long hallway going all the way down. Our office is dead center next to the stairs. Around 1.30 AM, I heard footsteps upstairs. Knowing I was the only person awake in the building, as my assistant was sleeping in the bed provided in the duty hut, I went to investigate. I checked all the rooms and found no one or nothing and came back down to my post and my assistant duty was awake and rushing to put his boots on. I asked him what was wrong and he exclaimed he heard a faint scream from down the hall. We both checked the entire perimeter and found nothing. Once we went back to the post, we heard what sounded like a door toggle furiously upstairs for three seconds and the rest of the night was quiet. I reported the events to my superiors who laughed it off and said it was dark. Found out these buildings were pre-World War II and supposedly a Navy corpsman failed to save a life of a Marine and ended his own life upstairs. Never confirmed the story to be true, but the events sure convinced me. I grew up in a house that was home to a malevolent entity if not malevolent in nature. I do firmly believe that this entity fed of negative emotions and energy. My family being largely dysfunctional and abusive, the entity was well nourished. It was free to roam the house. There's pretty much no part of the house I didn't see it in at some point, although it was mostly seen around the staircase. Hence the nickname Stairwell Demon my sister and I used on the ground floor. The stairwell demon presented itself as a large gangly shadow figure. Think slender man, but just darkness and only one set of arms. A very vivid memory of mine is the stairwell demon coming into my room at night, sitting on the floor while staring at me and getting into my wardrobe. Since then, I have been absolutely petrified of wardrobes. Now, I have left my family and that house behind. While I did have paranormal experiences in my first apartment, I've never seen the stairwell demon anywhere but in my childhood home. Something that always struck me as odd was how in movies and stories, a lot of the spirits slash entities seem to be focused on closets and wardrobes, or at least to seem somewhat fond of them. Any ideas what this could be? I was accused of being a stalker. Did I do what I was accused of? Yes. But let me take you to how this started. I was home making dinner. The only three other people that were in the house were my five-year-old son, his friend, and our foreign exchange student, Tina, who was 15 and extremely shy and didn't like talking because she didn't think she spoke English very well. I'm making dinner, as I said, and have my hands buried in a meatloaf and the phone rings. I wipe my hands and onto the phone and some lady's yelling at me. I can't understand her. She keeps yelling. And I got the words, son, police, kick, 
arse. She hung up, and I was standing there with the phone in my mostly wiped hand, very confused. I resumed my meatloaf when the phone rang again. It was the same lady who was a little calmer and said, Stop calling here. My son doesn't want anything to do with you. I already called the police. And I said, You've been calling me. I didn't call you. I don't even know who you are. The police will contact you and throw you in jail. I hope you rot in there. I didn't know what this lady was doing or where she was getting her information from. I was making dinner. My son was playing with a friend in the next room and Tina was studying. Later the same day, the police department called, asking if they could come over and speak with me. We set up a time and I'm almost in tears. Keep in mind I'm in my mid-thirties and didn't even pull pranks when I was young. I was one who always followed the rules and taught my kids the same thing. And now I'm being accused of being a stalker? This may not seem scary, but I was terrified, thinking this lady is going to have me thrown in jail without so much as an explanation from me. Not that I had one. I was confused. Two officers pull up and I open the door. They asked me to lock up my dogs as I had three Great Danes at the time. So I locked them up out back and come back to the door and tell them to come in. The kids were at the neighbor's house because I didn't want them to see me being arrested if it came to that. We sit at the kitchen table and I get them each a bottle of water with them asking about who lives here and where they are and I'm sitting there shaking visibly. I'm so nervous, my mouth is dry and I can't swallow and I can barely speak. Just then my husband comes home. He's the one who can talk anyone calm and practically could sell oil to Saudi Arabia. He's so smooth. He's talking to the officers and even though he wasn't here, he knows I'm not stalking anyone and that these accusations are ridiculous. They say the person said I called them and hung up. I said I was making a meatloaf and answered the phone with meatloaf residue on my hands and some lady began yelling at me. And I only understood some police kick an ass and she hung up. And then she called back. And I understood her better and she said that I was going to jail and her son didn't want anything to do with me. And finally the officer says, Well I don't think you had anything to do with this. But she has your number, so someone called. Do you think your kids have anything to do with this? I told him my little one was playing with a friend in the dining room, which I could see at all times and my foreign exchange student was studying at the time and she's quiet and there's no way she would stalk someone. Plus I was right next to the phone. There was another phone in my bedroom and no one ever went there, so it couldn't have happened. They gave me the phone number I was supposed to have called and didn't recognize it. So they asked if they could speak to Tina, who was 15. She was shy and I didn't really want to scare her, and they said they would just calmly speak to her, so I said okay. She came out, sat at the table with us, and they were asking her name, how she liked it there, and if she made any friends, and if she called any friends today. She said that she didn't, but then she said that she tried to call Jamie, but went over there instead, but came back home because everyone was upset about someone stalking their son. We came to find out she plugged an old phone into the jack in her room and it worked so she called from there and she hung up after two rings because she decided to walk over there since they live four houses away. My neighbours were getting calls from one of their son's ex-girlfriends and Tina just happened to call at the same time and they hit star 69 and called my house thinking that I was the stalker. Now star 69 was very new and I didn't know about it at the time. We had a huge laugh when the police called then told them that I was not the stalker. It was their neighbour, who they knew, and we were called. When I was seven, I lived in a small apartment with my mum, her boyfriend at the time and two siblings, one brother, one sister. My brother was a few years younger than me and my sister was only a few weeks slash months older. I shared a room with my brother for a while, but I kept waking up in the middle of the night, and I thought he was the one waking me up every night, so I told my mum. She moved my brother into a spare room, so now I was sleeping in this room alone. I went to bed as usual, thinking I wouldn't be disturbed in the middle of the night, so I was kind of happy. I remember waking up in the middle of the night and looking out my window. It was late at night. And there was someone outside with their dogs, so I figured the dog barked and woke me up. I rolled over to get out of bed and go to the bathroom. 
That's when I saw the dark outline of a man standing in my closet. He was tall, average build, and had deep, glowing red eyes. I froze. I felt like I physically couldn't move, and I remember hiding under my blanket and falling back asleep. This repeated for about a week, before I refused to sleep in that room and started sleeping on the couch. My mum got into a fight with her boyfriend one night and slept in my room, so she wouldn't have to deal with him. What I remember from her story is this. As she was about to fall asleep, she felt the bed shake. This couldn't have been explained by any pets, since we hadn't got any, and no one else was home. She ran out the room and was obviously shaken. A few weeks later, my aunt slept over, and as she was young at the time and had nothing to do for the weekend, she slept in my room, despite my mum warning, and the bed was dragged towards the closet. She ran into my mum's room, visibly shaken and wouldn't leave. Looking back on this a few years ago, I thought it was just my imagination, until my mum told me the rest of the story a few months ago. My stepdad said it was a demon living in my closet. I have a few stories to share. One is from my current command, MBK Bangor in Washington. There's a story that a long time ago, this little Indian girl was found by this guy, and he elected to end her life after subjecting her to horrific travesties. The man who owned this land before it was made into a base was the one who did it. The creepy thing is that her burial site is on the land deep within the woods. When I was taking classes to drive an armored vehicle, we had to do night driving, and the off-road course goes very close to the site. The sergeant who was operating my second set of eyes looks to the right side of the vehicle and told me to stop. It's pitch black, and I can't see anything without my night vision goggles, and think the sergeant is just trying to mess with me. The two other vehicles stop behind us and get out, asking what's up. The sergeant says he saw something in the woods when we were driving. It was out of my line of sight, so I didn't see it, but the sergeant was very spooked. The vehicle behind us started talking about the girl and a marine that ended his life 10 years ago. I'm not a believer in any of this, so I just say let's finish, because it's already 2am, and then we go through the course a second time. At this point I'm a passenger, and the sergeant is in the back, while a callman drives. I saw some stuff the entire time and said nothing. I asked around a bit, and that's when I found out it was a burial site. The thing I saw was about four feet tall and looked like a small person, in tall, random clearings in the woods. Definitely not shadows, and I don't think it was the NVD malfunctioning, but it definitely looked real. I've had other people go on this course, and experience similar things also. This didn't happen to me, but my mother last night at 3 a.m. My mum is really hard to scare. It takes more than a simple jump scare for her to flee a room. My mum was watching TV with us and fell asleep on the couch in her room. She woke at the middle of the night because she was freezing cold. So she grabbed her blanket and wrapped it around herself for warmth and walked to bed. Facing her closet, she began to fall asleep when she watched her closet door open slowly. A man, darkened in the darkness of her room, walked out and faced her. Suzanne, it said. He was about to say something else, but before he could, she bolted out the room. She said, that it's giving her the feeling that she knew someone was gonna die. One weird thing about it was that it wasn't sleep paralysis. I know most of you won't believe me, but I'm terrified. And if you know anything that can help, please tell me. When I was in the Marines, I was deployed to Afghanistan in October, 2011. I was on a forward operating base, Hansen for the first few months, and forward operating base Jackson for the last few months, before getting moved to Camp Leatherneck 
for the last few months, when our replacement showed up. My job was to operate the laundry service as well as provide clean water for showers. Technically not clean enough to drink, but you could, for US and Afghani troops. After the first few months or so on Hansen, whenever I tried to sleep I could feel a hand grabbing at my calf and slowly work its way up. I immediately dismissed it as being a result from stress or sleep paralysis type thing, and it would kind of subside since it wasn't a very strong feeling at all. This happened for a night or two a week, but eventually stopped. Fast forwarding to when I was on Leatherneck, nothing happened when I was at Jackson, or even my short trip to Nalay, so I forgot about it. At this point a lot of real life stuff had happened, and I was having issues going to sleep, so I would play music in some earbuds, or I would rewatch a movie in my head, basically anything to get my mind off the day's events. I slept in a room with two to four other people, so depending on who was there, I would try to be considerate, especially with the not ideal layout of the six or so bunk beds. There was an emergency exit sign above the door that glowed a soft orangey red. One of the nights when I was running something in my head, with me being 100% awake, eyes closed and no headphones, I heard two people talking. This was not something I would imagine at all, but I was curious since I could hear them quite clearly. The conversation in my head went something like this. Hi. Hey. What are you guys up to? We're just looking around. Where are you from? We work for Nying. You work for Nying? No, silly. And then I feel a slap on my sleeping bag. I immediately prop myself up on my elbow and look down at my sleeping bag, and there's a handprint on the fabric. Old, three-part, puffy sleeping system, where I felt the slap, and it was at an angle that no one in the room could have gotten at. The other two were passed out with headphones on, and on the other side of the room, there was no one else besides the three of us. At this point, I noped out for a smoke and then I returned and put some headphones on and went to sleep. Two nights later, I had the worst dream to date. I hope it was a dream anyway. I woke up in my bed and noticed that the normal orange light was blue and there was a faint electrical buzz and there was a figure standing in the light. It was a solid black figure with no discernible facial features, but I could see an outline of it and it looked like a British boy from around the 1900s based on the outfit. When I looked at it, I felt the worst sense of fear and dread ever. You could tell me that I had to go drive a car over a landmine, and I wouldn't feel like this. After a few seconds, I just drifted back to sleep, and nothing occurred for the rest of the night. Recently, I was in Charleston for a dance related event. My parents and I like to go on ghost tours when visiting places like Charleston, mainly just to hear the history of buildings and stuff. We decided to do a ghost tour of the Magnolia Cemetery. There were a lot of cool stories that I enjoyed hearing, but the one that stood out to me the most was little Annie Aiken. I don't remember much of her story, but I do remember our tour guide telling us that little Annie was a very active child and loved to play. We were told that she passed away at three of a sickness, which I can't remember. During the tour, I started hearing a young girl singing, but it was very faint, and I couldn't make out what the song was. I asked my mum and dad if they heard it, and they both said no. Also, at several points, I felt something wrap around my free hand. Sometimes it felt like a small hand, but other times my hand just went cold, and sometimes felt like I was being pulled into the opposite direction that we were going. Once we arrived at Little Annie's tomb, our tour guide told us her story. She then told us that sometimes, if Little Annie really likes you, she'll grab a hold of your hand, 
She also said that people have reported hearing a little girl singing Ring Around the Rosie and a small child wrapping their cold hands around someone else. Once our tour guide had told us that, my dad asked if that's what one I was hearing, and I told him I felt the hand too. I was hesitant to tell our tour guide then because we had a very freaked out and dramatic woman on the tour, and I didn't want to freak her out anymore. So I told the tour guide after it was all over. It was a very cool experience and I've never had anything like that happen to me before. I guess little Annie must have liked me. I live in a house that's not too old. It was handmade by the original owners and only two families have resided here. Since I've been here, I felt as if I'm never alone, always watched and have had strange experiences. While there's no logical reason to get into them, this experience is seriously freaking me out. A few months ago, I was sorting through coins with a friend when he found two coins that were different. They were bent and scratched to the point where the copper was gone and revealed the zinc underneath it. Obviously, he asked me if I'd done it and I told them that I found them while sorting through my closet. At the time, I didn't think much of it. People have weird ass coping mechanisms and interests. We make a common joke that the supposed ghost that makes me feel followed is named Keith. And it's also a recurring joke that he lives in my closet. So we joked it was him and didn't think too much of it. Fast forward to March 28th this year. I'm currently in my room. As of a few minutes ago, the pennies were sitting on my dresser along with some jewelry. But this is no longer the case. I was watching TV and decided to light some candles, one being on the dresser. After lighting them, I noticed the pennies were gone. I've checked the carpeting under the floors, behind my dresser, and the drawer, and everywhere it's physically possible for them to be, but I can't find them. Perhaps my brain is playing a trick on me, or I subconsciously moved them somewhere else. But if anyone has any information on this freaky stuff, I'd really appreciate it. My dad was a United States Navy helicopter pilot for 20 years. He was stationed on a number of aircraft carriers and had been all over the world. He had a lot of stories, but this one is my favorite. Many years ago, the ship my dad was stationed on was granted a night of shore leave in Tokyo. The next day when the ship was supposed to leave, it was delayed because one of the sailors wasn't accounted for. Turns out he was in a Tokyo jail. The sailor had gotten blackout drunk and on his stumble back had spotted something in a very expensive BMW he decided he needed. He broke the window with his bare hands, bloodying it severely. At this point, he must have decided he needed to clean up because he somehow opened a fire hydrant with no obvious tools. He was picked up by Tokyo police sitting on the curb with a bloody arm next to a broken in car and gushing water. Lucky for him, Japan had a cooperative agreement with the US Navy, where they let the Navy deal with these things internally, and he was quickly turned over to the ship and finally left. He was asked what it was that he was trying to get from the car, and also how he managed to open the hydrant. Unfortunately, he couldn't remember a thing about the entire incident. Go figure.